Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. I'm your host, Gregor Benio. This is my first podcast episode, and I felt that for the first uh, episode, it would be important to lay the foundation of the kind of approach and the kind of ideas that I would like to espouse in the podcast. The whole reason for starting this podcast to begin with is to have exchange of ideas with people of all different types that have different opinions and to have healthy, appropriate dialogue with those ideas. My aim is to have people to try out new ideas and to do it in a place where it feels natural and it feels comfortable. And so the enterprise of ideas is what I'm about and people doing that in a open and honest and authentic way. My first guest for the very first podcast here is my good friend, Tyler Van Ostrand. Tyler and I met in seminary many years ago. Uh, Tyler has a Master's of Arts in New Testament. He has a Master's of Arts in Liberal Arts. And he has a Master's of Arts in Philosophy with a minor in emphasis in Psychoanalysis. He is currently beginning his PhD studies in Philosophy. His main interests within philosophy are ancient Greek philosophy and with Nietzsche's philosophy and many of the uh, comparative uh, aspects of both of those time frames. In this episode, we talk about a lot of things. We, we talk about Freud and the power of his theory. We talk about Freud building a model of the psyche as built off of Plato's model. We talk about some of the clinical differences between current psychodynamic and more modern uh, therapy practices. We talk about Heraclitus. We talk about Heraclitus' background, and we talk about his philosophy of the Logos. We talk about Heraclitus as a model for Zarathustra, which is work by Nietzsche, and then we finally get into Nietzsche's theme of the eternal recurrence of the same and will to power and some of the similarities with the thought of Heraclitus. This was a very thrilling conversation for me. Again, Tyler and I are good friends, and so it really felt like we were having just one of our normal chats and we just, you know, kind of hit record and went at it. As you'll be able to hear, Tyler has a well-rounded, masterful handling of these very complex, tough uh, philosophical issues, and w- hopefully we are able to emphasize the importance of these ideas and these concepts, and uh, hopefully it can be of some use and of some aid to folks out there. So now I bring you Tyler Van Ostrand. How's it going, man? Going well, going well. How are you? It's it's going. I, I appreciate you being on the first episode of my podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, this is very exciting, and. As uh, I'm sure many people have told you, you're, you're perfect for this. Ah, uh, thanks. I hope so. It's, it's your destiny. <laughs> we'll, we'll see about that. We'll see. Yeah. So I'm here with my, my good friend, Tyler Van Ostrand. We've been friends for a while. And he's one of the sharpest guys I know. And he likes to play a bit in philosophy and all things uh, big thinkers do. So we're here, to, we're here to talk about a few things. So before we get into it, people don't know who you are. So just tell us uh, who you are and what your interests are and what you're doing now and kind of uh, what you're going to be doing in the next couple of years. Yeah, yeah cool. Uh, well, I'm originally from Ithaca, New York. I actually, I moved back here just a couple months ago, so I just came back home. So I'm in the central New York area, um, but I go to school and have gone to school for the last several years uh, in Manhattan at the new school, social research. Which is a, it's been a really great school. It's a really great experience learning a ton. I'm in the philosophy, the graduate program with a, a focus, uh, a minor in psychoanalysis. Right now, uh, I, I am doing a thesis on Freud and Nietzsche. And what I'm doing with them, and I haven't quite finished yet, I'm working on it currently, but the aim is really to flesh out the notion of Freud as a passive psychic model. And in that sense, or in a Nietzschean sense, you could say a nihilistic psychic model. Freud even extends to the philosophical realm. He extends it to almost a, well, a philosophy of life itself. Yeah. Right? With Nietzsche, Nietzsche is pre- presenting an active model 
of, of life through and through. Um, you know, the very kernel of life, the very essence of life is, is activity, it's will to power for Nietzsche. And this, this extends, you know, for him all the way up into the psyche as well and, 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 a, right. and activity and behavior. So, in other words, with these two thinkers, you have really similar things covered. You know, they're really discussing, you could say, the same things. Mm-hmm. But one's doing so from a purely passive model and one from a purely active model. Uh, which is just something I haven't seen emphasized. In fact, you know, I think primarily psychoanalysts have been concerned with the Freud-Nietzsche relation in terms of how did Nietzsche serve as forerunner. And, and really the main interest early on, it became in what way did, did Nietzsche kind of discover the unconscious? How could he discover the unconscious if it weren't for clinical research? Yep. In other words, for psychoanalysis, the question of Nietzsche was really where the relation has been covered. You know, so in terms of, that people have looked at the Freud-Nietzsche relation and not just assumed that Freud is kind of completing Nietzsche's project. So in terms of people looking at that since then and really considering that in a scholarly way, it's really only been how do they relate and how do their systems overlay on one another. So, for instance, a lot of people are making now Nietzsche-Freud or attempting to make Nietzsche-Freud kind of hybrids. Mm-hmm. And I suppose what I'm really interested in right now is the notion that, well, you, you can't actually make a conglomeration out of a purely active model and a purely passive model. It's kind of a you know, very serious violation. And mm-hmm. to that end, I'm really interested in what an active model would look like. And I've, you know, there have been sure. some put forward, but I don't think any have been done very seriously. Yeah, no. That's a thesis that I'm working on right now, and I'll it, have that done, it's done, great, by the, done by the end of the year, I hope. That, no, it's uh, great. As any of my listeners will pick up very quickly, Tyler's in the, in the thick of it at the moment. He is in the thick of it, which is great. He's doing good work. So, yeah, that's a great introduction. That's important work. And, you know, these two thinkers are, you know, kind of momentous for, uh, you know, you could say Western thought in 20th century, obviously. I mean, Freud is huge. Nietzsche is huge. Their influence spans across disciplines um, and still currently. Yeah. So let's, let's, do, let's do some fundamentals first. Let's do some basics, and then we'll get into the, the nitty-gritty. Okay, let's start with Freud. I guess we'll kind of work backwards. Freud is, <laughs> he's a polarizing figure. I'll just say this, in, in my field, in, in clinical psych, um, and even extensions of that, there are plenty of people that believe Freud is a charlatan, he's a fraud, he's just, you know, he did a lot, he did a little too much coke and was fascinated with sex too much, and, and that's about it, right? Um, people usually kind of can see his influence, people can use his, and he's a terribly good writer, but the theory in itself and how it rests, and then once you get into clinical application and or philosophical, you know, inquiry, he definitely has his critics, so I don't want to give a, you know, a Psych 101 course here, but maybe we can just kind of start with the power of Freud's model and why it's, why it's really good and why it has, I mean, it has flaws and, you know, issues like any model. And, you know, there's definitely a difference between early Freud and later Freud, for sure, um, which I think is an important distinction. But, yeah, kind of what's your broad overview of, you know, the power of Freud's model and, and why, it, why it's important? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I guess to start with, I think it's, and to make a strange comparison, I think it's analogous to the Bible mm-hmm. in the sense that Freud gets a really bad rap, but in order to dismiss him or the scriptures on their own terms, you know, on the level that they're actually operating at, if you will, you'd have to take them so seriously. Right. And so people who are saying, you know, oh, Freud's just a reductionist, Freud's just obsessed with sex. What you just did was said, I don't want to read it. Now I don't have to. Right. I don't want to take it seriously. Here's an easy way to, to dismiss the theory so I can move on to what I like, you know, whatever that, whatever that is. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for Freud, I don't know what it was for me, but um, it was not difficult for me to be able to tell that, man, that's, that's a complex system you got going on here. Mm-hmm. In other words, it's something that you have to take seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, and what was, and, I guess, what was like the one or two of the biggest components of that? I mean, he's definitely developed a, at the very least, developed a complex system. Whether people want to, you know, judge and critique the validity of it is another thing. But most people will give him credit that it's a complex system. But what is it for you that was just like, okay, this, this clicks. This is, this is something that, that works and fits 
uh, this system, this model of looking at people that hasn't been done and is still pretty powerful? Yeah. Well, you know, I guess to, to speak broadly about it, uh, Freud, insofar as he's describing, you know, the, the metapsychology, um, so the, you know, the topographical aspects of the psyche, the economical, the dynamic, you know, um, insofar as he's discussing this model, which is really the essence of his model, and it's developed, you know, mostly toward the end of his work, you know, at its, at its pinnacle. Mm -hmm. um, this model is, is platonic. Like, and I don't even mean a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, look in, look in the Republic. Read Chapter 4 carefully. Yep. Uh, you know, read the book. Uh, I mean, it's amazing, actually. And I'm not saying, therefore, that uh, Freud just picked up Plato and took it. My point is, is that what Freud was doing from the very, just in the simplest terms, is he was presenting what so far in human history is, is the most complex model of the psyche. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just in terms of complexity, right, if we've learned anything over the last hundred years in psychology, I would hope that what we've learned is that the human psyche is really, really, really complex. Like we don't, it is devastatingly it. complex. It, it, <laughs> it's as mysterious to us as, say, outer space is, you know, in an mm -hmm. in a, in a opposite uh, Certainly. In a direction. It's, it's similar in that respect. But, you know, we, we know quite a bit about it. We, we have, so for Freud, I guess, to back up, Freud took what we have with Plato's tripartite soul back in, you know, forever ago. Mm -hmm. um, and that model was never really developed after Plato. It, it went into, you know, the monks and the church and Aquinas and a couple other people took it and worked with it. Um, but not until Freud did that model, which, by the way, for Plato and for Freud, what you're starting with and what you have to acknowledge and what you have to try to explain is psychic conflict. Mm -hmm. and, and, and just just for just for clarity purposes, give me the give me the the the, the Reader's Digest, the Cliff Notes version yeah. of psychic well, conflict. Well, a quick, you know, and this is this is in the Republic, you know, so this is. This is back in, in 400 BC, they're talking right. about this. And they're not just talking about it like it's new, they're talking about it like it's old news. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, have you ever heard of the man who wants to drink but doesn't want to drink? <laughs> you know, and they say, oh yes, this happens all the time. Right. <laughs> um, you know, or you want to go to sleep, but you, you can't go to sleep and you don't want to go to sleep. And you can even have, you know, three and four of these variations of desires about the same thing at the same time in one mind, you know, and here we are thinking that there's one of us, of course, but like how is there four or five or six or a dozen of us, uh, so to speak, combating psychically? So psych psychology, psychic models historically, and I think probably always, must emerge from this premise of psychic conflict. You notice psychic conflict and you try to explain what is going on there? You already have a relation of two inside of one psyche. Mm -hmm. You're already dealing with a multiplicity, which it gets strange. Mm -hmm. um, and so for Plato, he said it was a tripartite soul where you essentially have, you know, reason, thumos, or the passions. Yep. And then, you know, you have the base kind of bodily desires, mm -hmm. you know, which corresponds almost exactly to ego Super it ego, ego, super ego. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, so all that to say, Freud took Plato, which which that was far and away the most complex thing anyone has ever attempted to do on the psyche. And I think we would all realize or admit that even that model is a reductionist model. You're like, yeah, sure, it's cool, but I'm way more complicated than that. We know that. <laughs> right. We know that about other people, especially. Mm -hmm. And you know, so my point is, I guess that Freud is taking this thing that was the most complex, he makes it a lot more developed, not just him. It's, you know, it's an entire, you know, cohort of yeah. an analysts who are taking this model. Let's say they're taking the platonic model, even though it doesn't, you know, unfold that way historically, right. but you know, they end up with this platonic model of the, of the psyche or the soul. And then they run around and they intermingle this with science, they would say clinical research. You mm -hmm. know? Um, so, just by virtue of the things I've said, 
psychoanalysis is unlike any other thing so far. I mean, it's like Plato, but in, as far as modern speaking, blending this with science and science, nothing has ever taken the psyche this seriously. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that's important is because it's not like a close race. Mm -hmm. It's like you have Plato and Nietzsche and, you know, Augustine perhaps and a couple others. And then you have Freud, who really took Nietzsche and and some other people and just ran. Ran with it, yeah. And nothing else is even close. Mm -hmm. By that I mean in complexity, uh, you know, every other psychic model, if you can even call most psychology these days psychic models, I'm not even sure if they qualify for that or if they even care. Right? There's no well, a lot of psych psychology. Well, in in some ways, but most psychology nowadays is very much concerned with maybe one part of yeah. a model of, of human existence and what it means to the human psyche. And, you know, you, you kind of have some, some interesting ideas both in, uh, in the literature, empirical literature about, you know, what, how do we understand metacognition? How do we understand the brain? How do we understand consciousness? You know, and that stuff is still early goings, but in terms of a, you know, a complex system of an organized system of trying to understand the human psyche in terms of all of the different psychic conflicts and tensions. You know, uh, Freud and, and his psychoanalysis is, you know, is, is still kind of, you know, the top in that in that way of doing that. Now, whether people agree or disagree or whatever, that's another conversation. But um, take, for example, you know, um, you know, behaviorism and 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 the kind of the most common practice uh, in in clinical work, in clinical practice, is cognitive behavioral therapy or some iteration of that. And there's different subsets of that now. And, you know, there's a model. And, you know, Aaron Beck is kind of the first guy. And, but, you know, he's, he's borrowing. I mean, he's Freudian, like most people were at first. And so he's borrowing from... Um, from that basis. And, you know, he creates his own model, but it does stay very much in cognition. It stays much in behavior. Um, it And, you know, there's ideas about core beliefs and intermediary beliefs and negative thoughts, but it, it, the emphasis is, um, you know, true CBT therapists would probably fight me on this, but, you know, there's an emphasis on, you know, it's very solution focused, manualized. It's very surface in some ways. You have a problem, here are some cognitive and potentially behavioral solutions, and you're good to go, um, which is fine. Like, that's a lane. That's an angle. Um, but in trying to understand, I think, the totality of the human psyche and what it means to be human and how to have, if you will, a healthy sense of well-being, uh, let's just use that, yeah. applied clinically, um, in my view, Freudian psychoanalysis or psychodynamic theory and therapy is much more far-reaching um, depth and width of what it means to uh, to be a little bit healthier and have better insight and you know all the rest. Yeah, yeah. No, I th I think so. And and you know I, I'm totally ignorant essentially of modern psychology or CBT. You know I I have a very surface understanding of it, which I hope to you know change one day soon. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, this is our this is this is the, such the nice. Uh, symmetry in our points of emphasis is, um, yeah. I'm not a CBT therapist, but, you know, you know, trained it in, have, you know, research in it. And so it's, it's nice, right? Because in my view, um, and I think you'll agree with this, you know, frameworks are important and, and not to say again, CBT or family systems or, you know, DBT or all these things, they don't have frameworks, but in trying to understand the human psyche, um, in the totality of the human psyche, uh, and what it's rooted in, uh, you know, I think Freud, at the very least, is kind of momentous in doing that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, another way to say it, too, you know, I'm, I'm probably being too gracious in terms of critiquing things that aren't Freud, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Freud's got the only game in town, I would say, on, on a model of the psyche, yes. right? All, and, and to kind of say it in a Spinozian way, CBT and things like it are concerned with final causes. Correct. Right? They're, they're concerned with the the outside end, the, the you know, what comes out of the system. You know? yes. in, in another way to say that is they're, 
they're concerned they've reduced the psyche down to that which you can measure. Absolutely so, yes. All right. So, you know, uh, from a philosophical standpoint, you could just launch missiles at that, <laughs> right? I mean, how right. they're critiquing Freud because he's reductionist and, you know, reducing the psyche and treating it in a manner only in respect to that which you can measure is, so, is I can't imagine a, a bigger reduction. Yeah. Of the no, I would. Yeah. Which is, you know, so this is the ultimate projection, but <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's what uh, you know. That's what you were saying, though. It's it's kind of unidimensional. And what I like about Freud, you know, there's a lot of things I like about Freud too. Um, Freud is a fantastic writer. He's yes. an incredibly rigorous thinker. Absolutely. And and I think in terms of people uh, labeling him a charlatan and discussing his motives, fraud and all that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you read his his work, which is very serious. Mm -hmm. His work is very serious. When you read his work, you see a thinker who is, who is so willing, even obligated, to change his mind. I, I, I agree Which, with this 100%. Yes. You know, you know, so he, he literally overturns his own theories yeah. regularly. It's what I mentioned at the top, which was there is a, a marked distinction between early Freud and later Freud, mostly in the you know, epistemic humility that he has of saying, hey, maybe I got this wrong. Hey, you know yeah. what, maybe I need to improve this. He, I mean, he lived, I think, into his 80s. You know, again, I mean, he's, he's, he's trying to figure it out. He's developing a system and a model. And to, I mean, later in life, you know, in 60s, your 70s, your 80s, to say, you know what, yeah, I can hear my criticisms, and you know, and you see this in Beyond the Pleasure Principle. I mean, it's, I mean, I think it's, I think it's one of his best works, because you yeah. see the, you know, he's able to kind of look back on what he's done and then say, these are improvements I need to do, and you can kind of capture a glimpse of kind of the future of where he was trying to take his model. But it, it does come out of a, a humility, humility, excuse me, and a, and a rigor. Um, that I, which is what you're saying, which I totally agree with. Yeah, yeah, and and what's fascinating too with psychoanalysis is it's not just theory, mm -hmm. right? It, it it was a theory and and clinical practice or theory and experiment, if you will, uh, uh, that was constantly cycling back and forth. That is to say, uh, the clinical research, the what he would call science, because that was kind of a looser term back then, yeah. um, that was constantly driving and reshaping the theory, which was constantly driving and reshaping the practice. And, you know, as we said earlier, it wasn't just one guy at this point. It was an entire cohort. Right. You know, I was, I was reading a, a book the other day. I was talking about Freud's, uh, Freud's uh, letters back and forth between some of his colleagues. And one of his colleagues, after I think it was uh, the ego and the id, uh, one of his colleagues wrote to him and said, hey, this one line you got right here, like, I don't understand that. I thought we've always said the opposite. <laughs> and Freud was like, I, I think he said uh, literally that I'm mortified by what he said. My mistake is horrible. And it turned out he didn't actually make a mistake. The mm -hmm. original guy just misunderstood him. And Freud changed it anyway because he was so terrified. And, you know, like, just, yeah. right. but you just don't get the picture. Uh, it's so different from what people think of Freud. Uh, yeah. So, he was a fantastic thinker. Yeah, yeah it, it's a I, testament I totally to. Yeah, it's a testament to Freud now to say that he's, to my knowledge, really only studied seriously in philosophy departments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I, 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 and and I would say the reason why is because people in other departments, other than philosophy, probably aren't able really to keep up with the level of writing that psychoanalysis is. It's it's a very high level of writing. Uh, high level of thinking, it's, it's, it's philosophy in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, I, I have kind of my, my soapbox, which I won't, I won't get on here, maybe, maybe, maybe another podcast or something, but, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the disservice that is done to clinical psych programs, not all, but a handful, um, uh, you know, or, or other um, programs in social sciences that don't read original source material especially on Freud, you know, I'm not talking about, oh, let's read a little essay or, you know, let's, you know, you know something like that. I mean, you know, really spending time, you know, to, again, to, you don't have to do that with everybody, 
But if it would be anybody, it should be Freud. Whether you, you know, there's plenty to disagree with him on, but, and the fact that that doesn't happen is, you know, I think downstream, what we're seeing now is a tremendous uh, void in intellectual rigor for clinical psychologists and others in mental health, where all you're trying to do, again, I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative about manualized based treatment or their empirical efficacy and or, and or effectiveness. I mean, that's proven its worth. But if you want to look at certain issues or certain syndromes or certain clinical problems or and or disorders, sometimes you need a more rigorous and robust understanding of the human psyche. And it, it should not be where Freud is, is, you know, placed on a leper colony of sorts, and we don't look at him anymore, except for just to point and make fun of him, um, in my view. And, you know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm willing to have those, those debates with, with people on it, but uh, I totally agree. There's one other thing I wanted to mention, again, just a little bit on the clinical note, and then we can, we can uh, switch gears, is, you know, psychodynamic uh, theory and therapy, which is a, you know, kind of one of the big three, if you will, of major theories used in clinical practice for um, uh, clinicians and therapists and psychologists is, you know, psychodynamic is pretty big. And, and it just in the spirit of how Freud did it and still ongoing for many of, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, depression, let's say, you know, plenty of empirical efficacy and effectiveness longitudinally and cross-culturally and for different ages all around is shown that psychodynamic work is just as effective uh, or efficacious rather as CBT or anything else. I mean, that's the lasting power of it. And, you know, usually it might be some hybrid of like interpersonal or relational psycho, you know, it's fine, whichever iteration you want, but the core of it is there. And I think that speaks to kind of the spirit of what Freud was doing himself with when he was developing it and especially in you know, later years. So I, you know, I think that, you know, kind of having that tradition and like you're saying that cohort, you know, kind of carries on. Um, and so, you know, I think that it's, uh, it's definitely something that people need to explore more. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I guess quickly to respond to that too, I'm not a uh, Freudian. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm not a clinician either. I'm a, you know, if I'm anything, mm -hmm. I suppose I'm a philosopher, I guess, mm -hmm. a thinker. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm interested in these things because I'm interested in understanding the psyche. Right. Uh, you know, philosophically, that's really important for whatever you know future projects I'm doing. I need to have this sorted out. And um, so, where I've washed out on this after spending a couple of years, three, four years, really serious on Freud, um, it took me that long, honestly. And I'm, I think, I'm fairly good at you know mm -hmm. working through these difficult things. Sure. It took me a couple of years to even yeah. get to a point where I felt like I could be comfortable critiquing what was going on. That's, it's pretty complicated. It's complicated. Uh, and I, and you know, that, that's to say where I, where I washed out now is that Freud's the only game in town. Okay. We're looking at it. I can either reject it after I understand it, reject parts of it after I understand it or not. My thesis is essentially me rejecting it aesthetically. Mm -hmm. I think it's disgusting to say that all life, as he says in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, ultimately wants to die. It ultimately longs mm -hmm. for death, right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of the, the fundamental death drive, yep. right? And you see, and you see this in, in his his uh, his you know first principle of tension reduction, you might say, uh, which ultimately leads to the death drive. Right? It's just kind of a derived from that. I mm -hmm. cannot really aesthetically accept any of that, right? Mm -hmm. so, so at this level, it's not for me about what's true or not. Mm -hmm. I acknowledge that at this level, what we're doing is we're interpreting the psyche, right? The question is, are we interpreting it on a level that's appropriate to it? Mm -hmm. I, I think the critique of, of modern models of the psyche and, and treatment seems to be, there's you know, very shallow kind of low resolution models, but you know, Maybe people think the psyche is very simple, you know, mm -hmm. but I, I don't, I, that would be difficult to argue. And, you know, all, all this to say, you know, if not Freud, we need 
models that are appropriately complex or I mean as complex or perhaps more or that, that are playing in the same sphere that are taking the psyche that serious and mm -hmm. that is to say uh, that they're they're uh, representing it especially uh, in, in terms of uh, mechanisms they're representing it in that level of resolution or better you know uh, so it's really an issue of level of resolution I'm thoroughly you know excited about the future where we'll see models that are different not based on sex you know say um, and we have seen some of these but models that are uh, uh, maybe amalgamations of Freud and something else maybe anti-Freud maybe a Nietzschean model but things that are playing along the same dimension mm -hmm. right? uh, and, and in fact that's what I'm working with in my thesis is as I said in the, in the beginning, Freud's model is passive. Nietzsche's model, insofar as you can say he has one, is active, and it was never developed, and no one's developed it really for him. Mm -hmm. Otto Rank did some work on it, but I, I don't think it was very it's Nietzschean little, work. It's, it's a little incomplete, know? yeah. Yeah. So, so, so I'll, I'll just say here, and we can, we can, we can move to the next, I guess, topic, which is, yeah, I think the, if you want to look for you know, application, not to need an application statement, but, you know, if you want to look at the pragmatics here is we need to have serious people doing serious work about developing models about the totality of the human psyche, not pieces or parts of it, um, and or incomplete or things like that as alternatives to Freud. And in, in my view, and I'm, you know, I have my own background and stuff, but saying this, you know, my current world is, you know, clinical psychology, but um, in my view, that's the, you know, that's the power of good philosophy. Yeah. Good applied philosophy. And Absolutely. I think that's, that's, and, and, I, and, and when you start thinking about, you know, kind of this intersection, if you will, of different types of uh, fields of discipline, there needs to be more of that crossing over with yeah. philosophy, with psychology, with, you know, sociology, anthropology, where it's not it less and less of, you know, and, and I know some people are doing this, but less and less of, you know, here's my camp, here's my camp, here's my camp. And, you know, we're going to butt heads and all this stuff. It, it, there has to be more of an integrative type of way. Um, I, I still think that there's importance in the traditions in and of themselves by themselves but then at some point there there has to be the i think a, a good healthy crossover as well yeah yeah i, I think you, i agree uh, totally I, I think you know initially science and psychology it emerged from philosophy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah you know um and and now after a lot of years now currently still i think philosophy is kind of seen as a you know it, it's a humanities thing mm -hmm. um and I think that's still right to say, but I'm for, you know, I foresee, you know, century down the road, I think science is going to, in a sense, kind of outstrip its, its uh, conceptual foundations mm -hmm. and require philosophy. Yeah, yeah and, I, I could and, definitely and, see that. Yeah, especially with AI. I think we're going to find, you know, just on the same topic of, of the psyche and models of the psyche, I, I'm not afraid of AI currently because, you know, from where I'm standing, I, I think the mind is way more complex than we can even conceptualize, mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. and especially than we can measure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, uh, you know, it's a cliche thing, but you know, think about measuring relationships or something like that, right? You know, person, yeah. it's it's always going to be at best, you know, super reductionist, mm -hmm. and you know, so. To the extent that science and psychology now is based on science, that is measurability, quant quantifiability. Um, to that extent, it's it's reduced to it's reducing everything else. It's excluding everything else, uh, which that's kind of the purview of philosophy is to come along and say, "Hey, this picture is really pretty serious." It's it's akin to, uh, in my mind, to we can set up a bunch of algorithms, you know, scientists mm -hmm. and mathematicians yeah. can do that. But in order to make them do something really, really crazy and interesting, um, you've got to set up 
the algorithms really carefully and think mm -hmm. a lot about the fun fundamentals, kind of, you know, like a Euclid. You've mm -hmm. got to set your, your axioms and your definitions very carefully. And science does that without realizing it does it. Yes. And so far, it's done it with a really stripped down model of premises. And, you know, let's work with the scientific method. But as we're seeing with, you know, quantum, quantum mechanics and so on, that's outstripped its mm -hmm. conceptual foundation. That's what that's what's happening. The only yeah. way to move forward, even if you want to move forward and measure things still, you yeah. know, in, in a meaningful way, the only way to move forward is is to insert a ton of rigorous thinking in a conceptual way, a theoretical way, in which you can couch all of this new data and facts and I, I agree with you a hundred and ten percent. And and yeah. I'm hopeful that we can, you know, as a a human race, human species, we can do that. So, okay. So, uh, that's probably good on Freud for now. I mean, I'm sure he'll, he'll pop up and he's, he's buried in our unconscious somewhere. So, um, <laughs> um, okay. So full disclosure. So, uh, uh, Tyler wrote a piece, you know, wrote a paper on, let me get this right, Heraclitus, uh, not Heraclitus, as he's commonly <laughs> yeah, known, Heraclitus, I think, which yeah, is a great, great piece. I, I absolutely loved it. So, but I don't want to skip, I mean, I think we have time, but I don't want to skip Nietzsche. So, and I know that maybe unbeknownst to many people, there is a very nice uh, uh, correlation between the two in terms of thought. Um, what do you think? You want to start with Heraclitus? Or you want to just dive into Nietzsche a little bit? Well, I, um, uh, I think that uh, doing Heraclitus first. Let's just say Heraclitus for fun. I don't know. Okay, let's say. Okay, let's Art, do. Let, yeah, oh, yeah I know. Me too. I have to like think before <laughs> I say it every time. So yeah. Heraclitus. It, in the Greek, <laughs> uh, the accent is on the alpha. It's kind of cute. <laughs> you know? Right. So, uh, but we're gonna say it in the uh, kind of. Anyway, yeah. In, in the, the modernized version. form, yeah. So, Heraclitus. Yeah. What's, what's really great in terms of a relation between these two thinkers, uh, which it's not, it's not a secret. Uh, Nietzsche, if, if you're really familiar with Nietzsche's work, mm -hmm. um, the way he talks about Heraclitus is totally unique. You don't see him talk. I mean, there are times in, in, his, in his work where he's, where he's, praising people or certain attributes or certain uh, approaches that they have toward life. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you never see it like you do with uh, Heraclitus. You never see it like that. He, right. he, he, uh, if, if there's a couple guiding stars in Nietzsche's, uh, you know, in his sky, in terms of his thought, even in, in terms of the, the development of his thought, because we can trace that through his work. Yep. Um, the the brightest star, you know, the North Star is mm -hmm. is, is Heraclitus for him, mm -hmm. um, and yeah. So 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 let's do, so let's do, yeah. Heraclitus is, is he's like the OG, right? He's like he's the dude, right? He's the guy that's just like from the old school and just really just set everything out for a lot of, you know, you're absolutely right, Nietzsche, and you can trace it. Yeah, it was his North Star. Um, you know, Heidegger as well, absolutely loved him. Uh, there's a bunch of guys that really loved Heraclitus and, and you know, that version or that time frame within uh, Greek philosophy. So, okay, let's do this. Give me the overview. A lot, there's a lot of people that may have heard the name or whatever, but they don't know, <laughs> they don't know the power of Heraclitus philosophy. So give me the, the overview of the, the most obscure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he, he was known in, in antiquity as the obscure philosopher, uh, which philosophy generally is fairly obscure, and uh, so that should say a lot uh, about him, and it does. Yeah. It really captures his style, um, which he's highly paradoxical. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms, you know, to, to situate him contextually, um, he flourished, as Diogenes says, uh, who's an ancient historian, he, he flourished around, uh, Heraclitus flourished around 500 BC, or they say the 69th Olympiad. <laughs> That's how mm -hmm. they track dates back then. <laughs> um, so he, he's from uh, ancient Ionia, which, uh, Ephesus, which is a uh, modern day. Uh, modern day Turkey, Turkey, right? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you know, Ephesus is still there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. he was royalty. 
they say. <clears throat> Although it was kind of a nominal royalty because at the time uh, the Persians uh, had dominion technically. And, you know, so it was kind of a kingship in name only, if, if you will. And, and he was in line. And <clears throat> he ended up abdicating the throne um, because he hated the, the way the Constitution was set up. <laughs> he said it was unsalvageable. Uh, he, he was ruthless. Uh, he was a ruthless guy. Actually. Yeah. Just, uh, I, and, and what I mean by that is uh, he didn't mince his words, and he was really passionate about what he believed. So he was a staunch, criticism, uh, staunch critic of uh, democracy, which at that time, yeah. uh, there were kind of democratic factions growing. Mm -hmm. And they were growing, and they were uh, stirring uh, kind of early whispers of rebellion in Ephesus against the Persians trying to, to uh, fight them back. And Heraclitus and his good buddy Hermodorus came out and said, uh, or this is really speculative, but it, but it makes sense. They probably publicly uh, spoke against this, and both were determined to be uh, traitors at that point. And they, mm -hmm. they kicked Hermodorus out of the city, which is a big deal, right? Because mm -hmm. it's, it's Heraclitus' best friend. Heraclitus is a freaking genius. Mm -hmm. and, and he says Hermodorus was the best man in the whole city, and they <laughs> kicked him out. <laughs> and in response, and this will tell you a little bit about Heraclitus, in response, he left Ephesus, never to return, went to the Temple of Artemis, which was, you know, I guess, nearby, and, mm -hmm. uh, and played knuckle bones with children and never, and, you know, didn't say, I don't want to be king. I don't want to participate in this stuff. I'm going to go play knuckle bones with the kids. And he famously said that all the Ephesians should hang themselves, every last one of them, and leave the city to beardless use. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he, he why because didn't they kicked worse. out <laughs> right they kicked out Hermodorus he was the best dude there what you know right. um so that's just kind of a little introduction to him um you know he's terribly elitist um mm -hmm. but you know this was still during the it was I think uh I guess socially or politically it was still uh an aristocracy yeah yeah or it was on the uh, way to some version of you know these democratic factions and stuff well, I mean, there was there was some sort of you know royal lineage in a sense you know, that, that he was a part of, um, mm -hmm. you know. So as far as we know, I mean, something like a nominal monarchy, you know, mm -hmm. just, yeah, you know, some sort of line. Maybe it was oligarchy. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly, and I'm not sure if we know yeah. Um, yeah. really what it, what it was there. We know it wasn't democracy. Yeah, we know that there were there were stirring factions of democracy, and democracy was already a, a well established form of government in ancient Greece, um, you know, which is fascinating back then for them because you have these city-states everywhere which aren't that far away from each other. Right. And, and everyone kind of knows about the ones in their, you know, the, the 20, say, around them. Right. And they, they all develop a different kind of government. You know? So <laughs> next door you might have about. a monarchy, you know, over here you got a democracy, and in Athens, you know, it's... You know, it's yeah, so it is wild. To think about that, especially in their close proximity of like, you know, just some wildly different ways of doing things and governing. Yeah. I'm sure there's a whole other conversation to be had about the, you know, in terms of uh, social groups and how, yeah. how that works. You know, there's some interesting yeah. stuff there. Well, they were already uh, deeply considering the question, uh, what is a democratic man? <laughs> what is a monarchy, monarchical man? That is to say, uh, what what type type of people do these types of government produce? Yeah, um, and that was already you know discussed back then. Um, but but moving into to Heraclitus's uh, philosophy, mm -hmm. um, let's just you know all that to say he's super elitist, which is is reflected in his philosophy as well. Sure. So he's uh, he uh, so he's a, a totally affirming. You know, and we were talking about activity and passivity and that sort of thing. He's, mm -hmm. especially for Nietzsche, this is a lot of the reason why he likes him so much, is every aspect of Heraclitus, whether it's his relation to the Ephesians or his, his conception of the cosmos, is this total affirmation of, uh, you know, of self and of activity, of, you know, vitality. Mm -hmm. um, and so... 
So for Heraclite, we could start with the Logos. That's yep. Uh, the Logos, Logos is, is huge. And, and what's the other one for Warp? Uh, pa Palamas. Pa Palamas, uh -huh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, those are going to be, you know, his two big terms. Um, that is, you know, roughly translated uh, the the recounting mm -hmm. or the, the tale, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, or you could say the rationale, and these are all kind of rough translations or glosses on what he means by mm -hmm. the logos. Yep. Um, so it's a tale, it's a recounting, um, and it's also a rationale, right? Mm -hmm. All of those at once. And, you know, to back up a little bit, uh, where did he get this logos? Well, the famous Delphic oracle, right? The, the, the saying, know thyself, yep. uh, that famous command. Um, Heraclitus gave the most victorious uh, interpretation of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said that he dove into himself. Mm -hmm. And therein, within himself, he found the Logos. And the Logos is the one rationale, the one recounting mm -hmm. of everything as one. You end up in this interesting little loop of one with Heraclitus. And this um, would include the actual cosmos. This would include, you know, life on Earth. This would include organisms. This would include humans. This would, it, it, literally one. Absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. So, yep. Yeah. So, you know, to premise, he would be really difficult to understand <laughs> if you don't first understand that for Heraclitus, wisdom is one thing. And it's separate from all other things. Mm -hmm. And this this is a really interesting method, methodological approach, uh, however you'd like to phrase it, um, to wisdom or truth or philosophy or knowledge. Because what he's saying is there is one thing that explains everything as one thing. Mm -hmm. Do you see? So... And unless you, unless you found that, you don't have wisdom. Yeah. Because there's always something that's going to subtend what you can explain. Mm -hmm. You're always going to have to leave things out and have multiple explanations. And, and, and so what he's really appealing to is explanatory power. Yeah. If you want to develop the highest degree of explanatory power, just like they're trying to do in physics and has yes. been forever. Mm -hmm. You want to find that one equation that you can put into absolutely anything and right. it, you know. So there are some premises in there that are, that are you know, obvious. You know, he's presuming that that is something you can do. But uh, I really like that sort of presumption philosophically. I, I, think it's, I think it's very strong. It results in really strong conceptual systems. Mm -hmm. um, but that's his foundation. So much, so much to say um, he famously critiques Pythagoras. Mm -hmm. who came, you know, a uh, century before him, um, I think a century and a half, something like that. Um, Pythagoras. He was the one doing um, all the math, math equations, right? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and he, he had his own kind of little math cult. Uh, at some think, point, I'm going to have to. Contemporary with Euclid, or I can't remember. No. I, no, I Euclid is, yeah, Euclid, I believe, is a uh, fourth century. Mm -hmm. I think Pythagoras is, is much earlier. Okay. Um, I believe uh Seventh century BC, I think, if I'm mm -hmm. thinking correctly. But that's somebody I need to really devote some time to because um, he's fascinating and mm -hmm. kind of is, uh, yeah. overlooked, I think, too. Mm -hmm. um, but he famously criticizes uh, Pythagoras um, for being the most learned man of all time. You know, he studied more than any man has ever studied. Uh, and he says that um, Pythagoras took from all of the things that he studied whatever he liked from them and made a wisdom for himself. <laughs> and he and he concludes with his little, with his jive, uh, uh, much learning a bad craft. And, and what he means by that is, yeah, cool, but you never found wisdom. You found what you like, you studied a bunch of things and came up with a couple things and kind of an amalgamation of things that explains most things perhaps in the way you like. But that's not what wisdom is. Wisdom is that one thing that explains everything. Yeah. One, it's one thing. And so if, if he were to find it, if Pythagoras were really wise, let's say, <laughs> right. uh, he would agree with Heraclitus. Uh, he would have found the Logos. Mm -hmm. So 
this is just to kind of set up his philosophy. Uh, it's really important to understanding his philosophy. Because I'll just, make, going, I just I'll make a side note here. I don't like ad hominem attacks on people. I, 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 I really try my hardest to not do it, and, and I don't like when people do it. But I just wish that if people were to kind of make these jabs at each other, ah, we should just do it in that way. That's such an awesome one. <laughs> Yeah, and leaving it on the ideas and just be like, you know what? You didn't figure it out. <laughs> I figured right. it out. And if you did, you would have came to my conclusion. <laughs> yeah. It's well, like that, the best that's best insult. <laughs> well, and, that, and that's what that's that's really telling of what Nietzsche loves so much about him and really telling of kind of what they share in yeah. disposition. Yes. Um, it's it's, it's like a temperament. Could, it's, there's a very there's a very similar temperament. You can hear it. Yeah. You know, and and they're, how they're approaching things. You know, there's this, there's this fascinating line that, that really relates to this from Heraclitus, and he says, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, he says something along the lines of, uh, we humans miss the greater part of the divine because of lack of confidence. Well, that's a powerful statement. You know, you know so it's, you know, he, the, to the degree that he was this, uh, this elitist, extremely confident man to talk, you know, talk crap, Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can cuss on this. No, you can say whatever you want. Yeah. He's talking shit to Pythagoras, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, which is a bold thing to do. He, and I guess what I'm trying to articulate is in order to articulate what he did, given its audacity, he had to be that arrogant. Yeah, you I can see that. You, you, you can't, can't talk about wisdom and kind of hedge. <laughs> yeah, well, and you can't talk about it at the level he's, he's talking about it, you know, um, and it, it, yeah, it's it's hard to explain, I guess, what I mean. But you know, his personality is matching his philosophy, as I mm -hmm. think they always do. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the logos. Yeah. So we got the logos, the logos. telling the tale. So this is central so the, to his his philosophy. But he's got, you know, fire and war and becoming. Uh, how does that yeah. all fit in here? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, to kind of recap quickly to to put those in in the proper place. Fire, becoming, war, justice. He's going to go on to say that the universe is becoming, or all is becoming. He's going to say all is fire. He's going to say all is war, right? You get the idea. He's going to say, you know, if you, what is this one thing? Well, it's becoming. What is this one thing? Well, it's fire. And what he's doing when he's doing that is he's acknowledging and approaching this one from different dimensions, if you will. Mm -hmm. It's kind of it's kind of an acknowledgement of, of the human constitution or, you know, our perceptual apparatus or whatever you want to mm -hmm. say. Uh, you know, we have different ways that we consider things. And so Heraclitus is going to give you four main explanations of everything as one mm. in four different ways. Mm. You see? Yeah. So they they overlap. They are all simultaneous. It's it's uh, similar to saying uh, you know what's going on on all four dimensions in this room. Mm -hmm. Right. You, you're still discussing this one event, if you will, or this that's, one. That's a great way of putting phase. it. Actually. Yeah. Um, you know, but perhaps with with Heraclitus, you know, maybe there are more than four dimensions. But I think to really capture his philosophy, you, you're going to put it in those four categories. The logos you know, to back up quickly, is the account. So mm -hmm. what, what, what is the account? Well, it's these four ways of looking at everything as one, mm -hmm. right? Um, so becoming is a good place to start with him. Yeah. You know, what is, what is going on, right? Heraclitus is fascinating because he, he tried to occupy the utmost distant possible position away from everything. <laughs> Like literally, he right. tried to he tried to see through God's eyes, past God's eyes. Mm -hmm. He wanted to go out as far as you possibly can, to the point where you get so far away that everything is one. You see mm -hmm. how you know it's a it's it's this impossible distance, mm -hmm. this exteriority, and from that lens, really to think about his philosophy. Imagine him out there at this unimaginable exteriority. <laughs> It's just like he says about wisdom, separate from everything. Mm -hmm. um, and he's looking at the one, the cosmos, the universe, and he's going to have four telescopes. Mm -hmm. 
or kaleidoscopes, I don't know, whatever. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Uh, lenses, I think, is how I put it in my paper. But the yeah. first one's becoming, right? All is flux. He, he says nothing stands still. And this is modern physics agrees with it. Yes. To my knowledge, right? I, I believe so, too. There is nothing standing still. That's, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's an axiom now. Um, and, and he knew that intuitively. Uh, he famously said, uh, you cannot step into the same river twice. <laughs> um, right. Uh, Panta Ray, everything flows, is attributed to him as kind of a summation of his philosophy. Um, and that, that is to say that nothing stands still. He's being very literal about that. If mm -hmm. you want to go down to the level of whatever level you want to go down to, no matter how far in the future uh, our, you know, understanding of, you know, the quark inside of the quark and so, you know, however far we want to go, right. uh, Her Heraclitus is saying nothing stands still. Everything is changing. And I think in, in, in term, uh, in our, in our modern way of thinking, and Nietzsche says this too, we're in that sense, we're very Heraclitian. Mm -hmm. Um, science is very Heraclitian in that sense. Yeah, I, think, I think modern physics, I mean, with the, you know, the advent of, you know, quantum mechanics, you know, we get kind of what you were saying, when you get down even to the smallest bits of observable matter in the universe, it's never the same. <laughs> so always, yeah. there, there's, and that's not to say that there aren't patterns. That's not to say that there isn't cycles. That's not to say, you know, of course, but at, at its fundamental basis, things are never really the same. They're always a little different. Yeah, well, and, and I'm, not, I'm not sure for him that's really, I mean, that's close to what he's saying. I think what he's I'm trying to emphasize with this becoming and change mm -hmm. is that everything is always in a process of transformation. Mm, yeah, that's a great way of putting it. And, you know, so like right now I'm looking at, uh, you know, there's, there's a valley and, and, a, and a huge hill over here. And we have a tendency, I don't want to say the hill's made out of granite. Mm -hmm. And we have a tendency to say, like, well, you know, that's not, it's not changing. That's not going anywhere. Right. Um, I don't know what, uh, you know, is, you know, some sort of uh, rock person will know these. I'm saying geologists, geologists, yeah, get, what get the geologists name of these on here people, and see. They're geologists. Yeah, geologists you know. and say, hey, what, what, what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, well, what I'm trying to say is, uh, you know, argon degrades into, I don't know, carbon and the half-life, oh, yada, yada, whatever the longest half-life is, mm -hmm. um, there's nothing that's going to stay. Everything is going to be in transformation. Yeah, and and I, I don't know about, I don't know very much about modern physics, uh, um, you know, so I don't know if that would be, uh, if that would harmonize with what they think about a quark, you know, is a quark constantly changing itself, right? Mm -hmm. Who knows? But even for Heraclitus in that sense, if everything is an arrangement of quarks, if you mm -hmm. will, uh, they're constantly shifting, mm -hmm. they're constantly transforming, nothing is standing still. So for, for him, um, the river, uh, the river fragment. You know, that you can't step into the same river twice. What he's really getting at is this, this, this transformative nature of the thing. Not that it's becoming something else necessarily. Mm -hmm. Not that the river is becoming not a river as it's changing. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's not necessarily becoming land, although he'll suggest things like that in his physics. But his point rather is that through its fluctuation, we have one thing. Right? And this gets into another couple of dimensions of his philosophy because with this one parable about the river he's making like 17 points yeah which which, which is what makes him so rich it's, um yeah it's, it's it's completely masterful when you you know we have fragments and you're like you're just getting all of this stuff and you you get the one thing and then it's right this is like 17 other things out of it it's, it's incredible yeah yeah i mean just to kind of try to illustrate it quickly and i'll miss a lot too with this river parable which or not parable with the river fragment which is very short um, you have, just like we said, all is becoming, you step in the river and you, know, you go to step in it again and it's, you know, changed mm -hmm. is his point. And therefore all is in flux. But in another sense, he wants to say that if this river weren't flowing, right, Pantare, everything flows, if it weren't constantly in transformation, it wouldn't be a river. Yeah. So, so it's, Which it's is, getting down to the... Uh, this little phenomenology, the, the thing in and of itself is what it is. That's yes. 
the, the transformation aspect of it is what defines it. It is what makes it what it is in itself. Yes, yes. Uh, and and Heraclitus wants to argue that about everything in a way. And <laughs> and what everything being the physical world and life itself, or or even the potentially the metaphysics as well. Yeah, even memes. <laughs> it's everything. You yeah. know, it's it, that's what's that's what's so impressive about him when you really consider what he's doing it is it we don't we only have fragments yes but it goes back to this explanatory power he was yeah. looking for the one thing that that uh, that that uh captures everything mm-hmm. and um man this is a this is so well built i mean it's it's really yeah. well built so to say that everything is becoming that's one thing right everything is in transformation but to tease out, you know, that thing we were discussing with identity mm-hmm. here, oh, uh-huh. it's it's through this changing, it's through this fluctuation that you get a singular identity, right? Do you see the paradox there? It's through this yeah. this multitude um, that you get this singularity. The and, thing, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and he puts it in a lot of other ways, too. He, they, there was a barley drink back then, uh, which sounds gross. Uh, I think it was uh, cheese. Uh, wheat and wine, and <laughs> that's that's it, not that's not that's not my cocktail mix. Usually, I don't know what yours is. That's that's yeah. not mine. Mine's yeah, usually something something with some dark liquor in it. Usually, <laughs> yeah, well, maybe you should try this next time. <laughs> maybe I will now. <laughs> we'll have a, a Heraclitus party. Yeah, and, we'll have a barley we'll drink. drink. <laughs> yeah, but what he wants to say about it is is apparently if you didn't keep stirring it. Which, mm-hmm. if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. If you right. if you didn't keep stirring it, that is, if you didn't keep it in constant transformation, constant change, mm-hmm. then then it would revert and kind of separate back into its, you know, three parts pieces. Mm-hmm. And and what what he's trying to draw out here is that it loses the it is no longer the barley drink mm-hmm. when you're not constantly transforming it. Mm-hmm. You have to constantly stir it, constantly change it. That has to be part of its its being, if you will, in order for it to continue to be what it is. It's this one thing, the barley drink. If you don't constantly change it, it becomes three things: mm-hmm. you know, uh, cheese, wheat, and wine. You know, in one thing. You know. uh, and so, this is and this is hence the I guess this example is the the very active element of this model and and uh, framework. This is yeah. as opposed to a passive one, um, you know, or like Freud, where we were talking about earlier with the, you know, avoiding death kind of thing. This is the active element. You know, this whole framework is very participatory. It's active. It's always it's a movement. Yeah, no, it's, that's absolutely yeah. true. Um, and, and, you know, that becomes even more the case as we go on, you know, to his other kind of lenses, you know, so to kind of, I guess, to, hint, to touch on that point right away. You know, we were mentioning earlier another pillar or key lens that is to say uh, another thing that he says is one, uh, you know, another explanation of what the one is, mm-hmm. th- that is the universe. He looks at the universe through another lens, which is really similar and overlaps it, uh, with the one of becoming. And he says, what's going on here? Everything is war. Mm-hmm. And, and he literally means everything. Mm-hmm. Everything from uh, you know genetic uh, evolution to you know I don't know literature top ten charts it's, <laughs> it's, and and like your relationship with your mom too you know right. it's yeah you know, and your shoes mm-hmm. it it's and the grass <laughs> it's, it's it's absolutely everything it's tension in everything. Or is it more than just tension? Is it like just full-on trench warfare? Well, there are three really important components to to this war for Heraclitus. That is polarity. Mm -hmm. Just like we kind of touched on earlier with this constant change and singular identity. Um, And there are all sorts of other ones like that, right? He says the way up is the way down. The way up and the way down are one and the same. Good and evil are one and the same. Day and night are one, right? right? All of these are these polar tensions um, 
that he wants to say, or that he says, is is in everything. So the first uh, part of them is this polar tension. The second part of them that's really necessary is that they're fluctuating. Hmm. It's not some stable mm. tension per se. It's 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 an active tension. Mm -hmm. um, so much so that, and this is, I think, it's really difficult to grasp, but I think it's fascinating. Qualia or, you know, perceptible qualities, mm -hmm. right? If we're saying everything, like Heraclitus says, everything is war. You know, my, my table's war. It's all this, this fluctuating tension. Right. Um, how do we get these distinct qualities everywhere? Well, what he says is, you know, so, so the perceptible world or the, you know, all of creation is the flashing, the victory flashes of swords, of dueling swordsmen <laughs> or swordswomen, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's, it's always these two warriors uh, perpetually locked in battle against each other, these polarities, but there is a genuine fluctuation. Um, and what's really interesting about his, his notion of war is there are a couple kinds, and I've never seen anyone develop this notion, but there are a couple different kinds of these polarities in his philosophy. It's, okay. You know, there are ones that are eternal, right? Day and night are one. You know, we're mm -hmm. never going to, that's not something you can kind of replace day with something else in the future, or, you know. Um, so it's kind of, I don't know, an eternal polarity, you might say. Right. Um, then, he, then he has some polarities where uh, one seems to be changeable. Uh, yes. You know, uh, Nietzsche maybe would hint on one of these with God versus nihilism. Okay. Yep. Uh, I don't see how you can say there's not always a polarity against nihilism. That is mm -hmm. the absence of, vi of value. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you're always going to have a nihilistic warrior interlocked with someone else. If you know to say that to right. personify sure. whatever is staving off nihilism, and and you know through this uh, tension of polar fluctuation, um, things emerge, right? Yeah. Like 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 we said, the 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 flashing, the flashes of the dueling swords, the victory flashes. So so this war, the reason why it's not some dark weird view, or maybe it is, but but it's not as dark as people think. Is it's generative. War is the father of everything. Mm -hmm. You know, are you in love? Well, war is to think for that. Yes, yeah. it's, it's it's everything. You know, are you coloring a coloring book? You know, it's, <laughs> you know watching a butterfly. Mm -hmm. it, in other words, you have to really expand. You know, you have to kind of try to appreciate what he means by this this war. Uh, it's, it's because pretty, it, it seems it seems if if I maybe maybe I can underline this is. The, the fact of doing something, coloring a coloring book, you know, being in love or whatever, those things are doing something. And by proxy, they are also not doing something else or, or, or being more, I guess you could say stagnant. I don't know if you could say it that way, but there is this to do something means to also have the negation aspect of it as well that you are not doing. And in that way, you know, that is with everything, always some type of, you know, in his framework, war. There's some yeah. tension that is happening in everything, right? You can yeah. obviously see this through the evolutionary model and all the rest, but there is always that going on. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what's really fascinating and really difficult about him is that he says that everything is produced from this tension. It's not that this tension is in everything. It's that everything is, is coming from that. Is, is an effect of yes. this of this war. Yes. Uh, a continual, perpetual effect. So, 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 um, sorry. It, 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 I had a, a thought here on this. Is that basically, when you look at, um, let let's say the concept of life, living, life itself is coming out from uh, war. Yeah. Life in itself to live is coming from tension. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and again, this is what makes him the, you know, the obscure philosopher and what makes his system so powerful. He's any way that we can kind of sit here in an hour or two or even a day and, and say, well, this is how it's for. 
And perhaps also this is how it's for. And perhaps also right. this is how it's for. Right. We could never capture this this enlightened, crazy vision he has of this infinite network of interlocking, interconnected, multi-dimensional war. Yeah. It, it's like if, if we found a polarity, like say good and bad, um, it's connected to and the result of and resulting in <laughs> all of, you know, it's this right. immense, so much so that there, there's no free will. There's, everything is determined. It's all, you know, there's no teleology. Uh, mm -hmm. Free will isn't really, you know, a right, right thing to say. There's no teleology in any of this system. There's no end. None of this is going on for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, none, none of it was designed. He says uh, the universe uh, uh, wasn't made by God or man. It, it's eternal. It always has been, always will be. Um, you know, and, and so in this sense, and he, he actually, to, 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 how do I say, temper um, perhaps this notion of war a little bit, of ubiquitous universal generative war that's mm -hmm. the father of everything. Right. Um, to temper that a little bit, he says, well, you know, what's the point? So, you know, why? <laughs> What's this going on? And like, uh, he says, well, it's, it's, it's no big deal. It's Zeus. <laughs> it's Zeus playing a game. Right. He's rolling die. <laughs> he's, he's, you know, the knuckle bones, from what I understand, you know, they would literally use, um, they would use, literally use uh, the knuckle bones of, I think, sheep, or, you know, <laughs> lamb. Uh, and, you know, something like jacks, where they throw them up, and depending on how they landed, there are multi multiple sides and possibilities. And so Heraclitus uh, says, well, you know, how's all this war going on? What's the point of it? Like, what's the end goal here? What's the reason? Why is this here? And he says, it's literally just him casting. You know, mm -hmm. he's just playing. He's mm -hmm. playing. He's not, it's not even necessarily that he's trying to win. <laughs> there's, there's no winning. Right, it's just, right. there's uh, no winning, right. Yeah, and, and, and it's fascinating how he puts it. He says, uh, the God child, Zeus, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is to emphasize this innocence. Mm -hmm. It's this, so, you know, it's ubiquitous <laughs> war through innocence, non-teleological, you know, with no end, <laughs> will right. not end, right. had no beginning. And, um, you know, and I guess this is a good place to, to step forward into his notion of fire because okay. not only did it not end, will it never end, but it goes in this cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and this is another way that he justifies uh, existence, right? He's, he's famous, and Nietzsche, for example, loves him so much because he justifies all of existence, mm -hmm. right? every single thing, so much you know, to, to the degree that he's justifying war. Right? I mean, war is this innocent play of a child, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's you know, uh, don't look at it as this crazy, heinous thing. It, yeah, when, when I see the gone child thing, you know, when I've read it and, and hear you say it now, it's, it's like this, at least in terms of concepts, you have this, um, I guess you could say innocence in the child part of it, or this uh, sort of concreteness, if you will, and you think about a child or, or kind of temperament of that, aligned with power and power of a God, which... I'm sure we'll get into yeah. power in a little bit, but yeah. you know, and it's that kind of uh, marriage between those two concepts that are in what life is coming from the tension. Yeah, which is yeah. you know, it, it, I mean, again, just a side note before you go get into fire. You know, you're saying a bunch of things, and there, you know, there's a billion ways you can look at you know all the application that this has for us currently. But, but just one thing I want to say about that is the power, I don't know if, if, if listeners can, can, can get this, but the power of his model and framework is two, twofold here so thus far, which is the fact that the scientific method and the enlightenment and reason and science for literally hundreds of years outside of uh, Heraclitus, and we're still doing his homework. We're still yeah. just reiterating that is absolutely tremendous. That's oh. number one. Number absolutely. two is 
uh, I'm going to refuse the <laughs> kind of the social commentary on this because I know it gets, you know, I don't mind having the conversation, but I want to stay focused. But people say a lot of things. They say a lot of things about elites. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that is rightfully so. There's a lot of justification for <laughs> picking on elites. However, when you look at Heraclitus, he comes from some type of you know, he's a little bit higher in the hierarchy. He comes from an elite class. He's, you know, kind of at the top. The fact that he found this out by leaving the city and by playing, you know, knuckle bones with kids and developed a theory or not only a theory, a framework of understanding everything, you know, is tremendous. This wasn't done because he was you know, and not to say that it's not influential, but he was just stroking his beard and talking to a bunch of old dudes. Like this was from being with different context, a different setting, looking at, you know, children and playing with, you know, certain kind of, you know, child's game. And to understand that there's something, you know, maybe that's just kind of the more psychological narrative of that. But I find that very interesting. This didn't come from, you know, some big treatise that he was writing down somewhere. I mean, this was kind of living a simple life, kind of living a, you know, I don't want to say a working class, but just kind of like a rural kind of way of living, just kind of living outside of the elites. And he's finding this out, you know, which I think is, in some ways, I think it's important. I don't think it's the be all end all, but I think it's, I think it's important to kind of, kind of footnote. Yeah, no, I think so too. And, you know, picking up on that a little bit, uh, and this touches another aspect in, in which Nietzsche is really related to and and really um, admires him. And that is, well, to talk about his cosmology like you were a little bit, he this, he's not standing on people's shoulders. This is this is genuinely yeah. unique. He was the first person to do right. this. Right. You have you have Thales of Miletus, you know, before him who said all is water and. But he was really, you could say, probably more of like a, a scientific approach. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Heraclitus is coming along, and he's going to do a, this very aesthetic uh, presentation and rationale of the entire cosmos. And what's really unique about him is the fact that he justifies it. But um, so, you know, so that's just to say something like you were about how unique what his project was. But part of what, what Nietzsche loves so much about him is he was this first archetypal, which becomes, you know, a, a pattern, but he's the archetype of this pattern and the first. Um, he is a troglodyte. He said, I can't stand the <laughs> herd, right? And he said, I can't, I can't do this anymore. There's too much corruption going on here. All of this is wrong. I have to go away. I'm going, and he literally went, you know, so he spent time in the temple, but then he, he spent the rest of his life living in the woods by himself. Mm-hmm eating grass, you know, herbs. It says he, he lived on herbs uh, until he eventually, around like 60, developed dropsy. You know, I guess that's, you know, like fluid buildup yeah. in the lungs, I think. Um, so he developed dropsy and eventually goes back to Ephesus to try to be treated and dies. Um, but Which un- know, that- is not unlike Nietzsche, who also, you know, Sils Maria is living over there in the, in, in, in the mountains and developed much of his thought after kind of just, he was just kind of done with academia. He was done with that elite. He was, done, and that's where he finds us. And, and I, I, you know, Heidegger did the same thing, black forest doing all that stuff. And I think that is what it's a small point, but a big one, because it's like people have a certain disdain or a certain negative attribution that they're placing on academia and academic elites. And again, rightfully so. But I think anybody that's worth their salt isn't just staying there. They are doing, they're, they're doing the thinking aspect in the real world. They don't just stay in, in elite circles. And I, and I think the people that have had, in my view, some of the best models and the best thought are the ones that lived in the real world. And Heraclitus is one of them for sure. Yeah, yeah. And by that, you mean kind of, uh, you know, intimately connected with nature. With so. nature or with, you know, common folk or and all the rest. Yeah. Well, you know, and what's interesting here is Heraclitus, 
especially looking at this through, through uh, Nietzschean lens, Heraclitus is the first, well, he's, he's the kind of model of Zarathustra, mm -hmm. who, you know, if we remember I was, from the I was thinking that earlier. Um, Zarathustra abandons everybody. Abandon's not really the right word. It's not like he's leaving something. He's pursuing something is what mm -hmm. he's doing. Yeah. And what he's pursuing is himself. Mm -hmm. right? he, 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 it, it, and this doesn't go into this in Zarathustra, but Zarathustra, it says uh, he takes his ashes into the mountain, and there he contrives a new fire for himself. <laughs> and then he, then he leaves. He eventually comes back to mankind, which Heraclitus does too because he drops off his book at the Temple of Artemis for everyone, mm -hmm. right? So uh, Zarathustra, too, leaves the mountain, passes the old saint in the woods who says he's transformed. Uh, right. And, you know, this, this echoes Zarathustra's later calls, or Nietzsche's later calls, where he says, uh, will you go into isolation, my brothers? Mm -hmm. um, talking to his, his disciples, his, these new philosophers, the philosophers of the future. And that model, that archetype began with Heraclitus. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the reason why it's significant to do this, this, uh, this isolation uh, for Nietzsche or for anyone that Nietzsche, you know, for, for anyone who wants to kind of very seriously, rigorously think about something, come up with something new, you know, maybe you could even say discover yourself. Mm -hmm. And the reason for this is you have to get out of, and this is even back in Heraclitus' time, this is an acknowledgement, again, to the complexity of the psyche. Mm -hmm. the, the, the premise here in this isolation and rigorous creative philosophical thought is that you've got to kind of get away in proximity from all these affects that are constantly filling your psyche, affecting you in ways that you don't know you're being affected. It's so much so that you end up being like, well, this is my view on X, Y, and Z. And when you, if you're really questioned mm -hmm. about it, you find out it's not your view. You know, it's, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll say I'll say just on that. I I totally agree. And, and you, you kind of mentioned it. And I'm gonna uh, uh, blow it up a little bit. Which is, if Heraclitus had to do this in the fourth century BC, yeah, how much more would it behoove humans in the 21st century AD with the immense amount of stimulus that we get yeah. every, it's literally, I'm not even, it's, it's not hyperbolic, every minute. Now, yeah. I, I'm not gonna make, you know, any any um, absolutist statements about, you know, technology or modern advances. I think that stuff's great. But in terms of trying to figure at the very least yourself and by uh, proxy than others around you. How if it if this is where this the 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 enterprise he took on was to have some type of uh, contemplative thought or to be alone and to have some type of isolation? How much more is it relevant to us as you know humans in the twenty first century? to also do the same. It's, it's virtually impossible to do that with all the stimulus that we're engaged in yeah. all the time. Yeah, no, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I think Nietzsche acknowledged that and saw that coming as well. You know, it, it's, it's interesting you know, in the sense that the individual is kind of a new concept. It's also not in a way you mm -hmm. see it, you know, ripe and fully developed with, with Heraclitus. Yeah. Um, you know, even in his very impetus and in his philosophy too, this, this the diving into yourself uh, isn't just something he says he did. It's it's a prescription. Mm -hmm. um, and and like you're saying, you know, it, during any age that would be really hard, just probably because of you know how we're wired to be a social animal and how that affects us. But right. you know, and I think you've probably had this experience too. Um, the more you dig into psychology. Uh, that's really what you're doing. Like insofar as you're learning about the mind, you're learning about the ways that we can be deceived or deceive ourselves or be misled or be affected unbeknownst to us. Uh, and, and the bigger those ways, you know, manifest themselves and the more you understand them, the, the, it gets very frightening. You know, you, it, it has an effect on me sometimes where I'm like, Oh man, I just want to be a rationalist. Like, uh, I, I don't know how else other than geometric proofs we can move forward. <laughs> right. We're so poisoned by other ideas and, you know, so, so on. But I take your point with, with modern uh, 
with modern communication, modern information. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think even somebody, you know, like, like us, who is really, you know, you, you might say we're really concerned about uh, what we think about things and how we think about things. Mm -hmm. Even for people like us, um, man, I don't, I don't think I can ever escape uh, yeah. my external influences. And I don't mean just a little bit. I mean, it's to the point where I think there's a certain enlightenment in uh, the progression of the way you think about how you think. Mm -hmm. And, and you, I think you have to get to a certain point where it's all aesthetic. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and Nietzsche acknowledges this, you know, every philosophy, you know, he said hitherto, that is before him, but every mm -hmm. philosophy is an unconscious autobiography, something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and, but at the same time, these philosophers are like, no, I'm thinking rigorously and being objective. <laughs> Um, right. and, and that's what makes, makes Nietzsche. And if you look carefully, I think Heraclitus wonderful too. They acknowledge this. They reach the point where you say, okay, well, we're no longer talking about what's right. We're so affected by other things, by other mm -hmm. opinions in ways that we don't understand. I'm going to fully affirm myself, mm -hmm. what I think, all the ways I've been affected perhaps, you know, and, and then therefore, you know, so, for example, for me, you know, you and I went to seminary together. That's right. Uh, that was a million years ago. <laughs> I think back then, if you were to talk to us, we probably would have said we are in the business of searching for truth or something like that or affirming the truth or... A hundred percent would have said that. Right? It, you know, <laughs> you're appealing to some transcendent uh, constant. And I think intellectual maturity, and this is going to be insulting to many people, is when you stop doing that. You have to get past, you have to mature past the point where you realize that truth ultimately is, you know, this, in terms of a uh, societal effect, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's this constantly fluctuating thing that appears to be uh, fixed. What did Nietzsche say? A mobile army, army of metaphors or lies that we've forgotten our <laughs> yeah. lives. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. the most useful lie for a, or necessary <laughs> lies. Uh, right, uh, these right. things, you know, so then you're like, oh, well, crap, what am I doing? Uh, what am I doing in this philosophy stuff? And and you get to, I think, I, I hope people get to the point where you say the only way you can justify the world and life is aesthetically. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, Nietzsche says this somewhere. Uh, he says, uh, we no longer reject Christianity because of, you know, because it's not true. We reject it because of our tastes, um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. which is just kind of this ultimate acknowledgement of, uh, hey, look, I am what I am, and uh, I'm going to fully embrace this. It's got multiple uh, factors. I'm just this crazy, complicated algorithm that is necessary. It's an, it, you know, I am necessary. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and so Heraclitus is doing that, too, with his cosmos. That's why he's. That's why he's able to sit there and, and talk shit to Pythagoras. Mm -hmm. uh, it's this. It's this complete affirmation of self. But yeah. to tie that back into this uh, going off into the woods and this isolation from all of this crazy data, Nietzsche and Heraclitus would say, you know, those things are necessary. If if you really, if you really want to know thyself or or um, dive into yourself. Uh, man, you've got to somehow disconnect from absolutely all of the things. You know, it, you've got. I, I think as a as a society, we have to. I think magnify the 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 fact of how affected we are by things. Absolutely, it's, it's not it's not something that that like it's something we all kind of know, but it's not something that that we really operate with the knowledge of um, yeah. the the awareness of it. Uh, and I guess most people don't care, right? And this is where the elitism comes in. <laughs> yes. I don't know. I, I guess if you told, uh, you know, a thousand people, you'd find a bunch who are like, "Look, I ain't got time for this shit." <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, that's not um, that's not my thing. I, I don't I don't want to do that. I got I got too many other things going on. And right. and this is, uh, you know, this is this is uh, I think of the Heidegger quote where he says that you know we we. When we hide out in the anonymity of the average everydayness, right? When the they, the others, they tell us how to live life or how we do, you know, they say they do this. And 
it's very comfortable to hide out in that. I can I can be anonymous. I can I can just you know peel back into that into the average everydayness. And you know we could talk about Heidegger later, but um, you know that's his whole thing about living authentically and all that stuff. But yeah, I, I definitely think so. Um, okay, so I want to give I want to give some time to Nietzsche because he's he's a uh, he's a badass. I think that's. Oh, that's, that is definitely the most I've ever talked about Heraclitus with anybody, <laughs> which is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And that, it's, I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, listeners well, will, we will also, also pick him up. <laughs> we only finished half, though. There is oh, uh, we did. fire, okay, so, <laughs> fire and justice. justice. Okay, so yeah, let's, and, yeah, give me the, the briefer versions of those. I think becoming yeah, a war is be, very important. Yeah, I'll then try we'll to be quick. Nietzsche. Well, fire is really important for the connection with Nietzsche. Uh, the, the justice part, you know, we can quickly summarize because we have been talking about it. Mm -hmm. This aesthetic, Heraclitus looks, he's in this utmost, you know, you could say he's in God's position, looking through the eyes of the most exterior thing. At the world as one, he pulls out the lens, he sees everything as becoming, right? That's kind of like, what's the activity? He pulls out the other lens, what do we do second? He says uh, everything is... is, is um, the tension, the conflict. Yeah, everything is war. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, dis the subtle distinction between these two, everything is becoming is kind of the activity, everything is war is kind of a quasi-phenomenological lens. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. what's, what's the experience going on, if you will, right? right? The third one uh, is fire. And what this is, is he's, he's essentially developing the first physics. I mean, this is, this is the first physics. Uh, you could say maybe Thales did it a little bit with water, but it's really underdeveloped. Mm -hmm. um, you have the first physics, you have the law of, not, of, of conservation mm -hmm. articulated in, in Heraclitus in 500 BC, um, all on his own. You know, he wasn't a scientist, he's just thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so he says all is fire, and this is kind of an elemental aspect of his philosophy. And, um, you know, what he says is, imagine a ring. He calls it the turnings of fire. He says, he says the cosmos is eternal. It never ends, never began. And it's not teleological, that is, it has no end, mm -hmm. no aim, right. there's no purpose, there's no kind of end result we're working toward. So uh, a ring represents this physics. It also represents the cosmos, uh, the transformation. We were talking about all this flux. Mm -hmm. We were talking mm -hmm. about everything is a, a, a polymos, everything is in this tension mm -hmm. that's producing, producing this change. Well, when he's looking at everything in, in an elemental way, he's Again, these are all overlapping. So in, in terms of a physics, you have at the top of a ring, a top of a, of a circle, the turnings of fire being the whole circle. That is to say, the way fire transforms, really. Mm -hmm. At the top of the circle, you have pure fire. Right? You have this, and he really does want to say it like that. The highest thing in all creation for Heraclitus is fire. It's not humans. Mm -hmm. It's not intellect. It's fire. Uh, why? Because we, what composes us, uh, we're, we're what? We're, we're stardust? Uh, you know? <laughs> yeah, stardust uh, the, and water and right. <laughs> matter. Yeah. And again, you know, Heraclitus is right. Again, it's, it's, it's brilliant, right? It, everything has been fire, if, you know, it, every, in terms of how the elements participate in the process of fire is how we mm -hmm. say it now. Right. It's a chemical process. But... Uh, yeah. It still works for what he's saying. Everything has been fire. Everything will be fire at some point. Right. And for him, everything that isn't fire is some sort of, uh, how do you say, it's a, it's a transformation of fire along this cycle. So he actually has this all laid out in, in fractions. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it goes from fire to air to water and to earth. And, and mm -hmm. there are specific derivations by which it breaks down. Right. And he call, he's calling it all fire. So when he looks at the the the, the substantive cosmos, the, the the universe as a as a material thing, mm -hmm. he's saying ultimately all is fire in the sense that it it is always going to be and has been. It's always in a state of going to return and coming from fire. So he says, and this is a difficult concept, but he, and it's important. He says all things are exchange, exchanged for fire as wares or wheat are for gold. So mm. just like you buy, you buy mm. food at the grocery store with money, the same way everything must be purchased by fire. That's and, very and, well saying it. 
And it, what he means by this uh, is that everything comes from fire's ashy womb. Mm. Uh, fire is the great recycler. It's mm -hmm. the universal recycler. Um, and, you know, you, you also have to understand here, he doesn't mean like a campfire, per se. He's talking about fire just like he was with war in this very kind of broad, mm -hmm. broad sense. So the reason why this is important is because we get this ring, which, you know, to tie it into Nietzsche, mm -hmm. Heraclitus justifies the world that is unlike Christianity and all these other models that say this world is fallen, it's fallen and, and corrupt because of all the injustice and the problem of evil and bad things right. happening to good people, et cetera, et cetera. Heraclitus dispenses and he, he supersedes all of that. Mm -hmm. and says, look at this ring that we have, the turnings of fire. And he says, if we look at fire as a judge in kind of an aesthetic sense, it's that which destroys and produces everything in one. It's also change incarnate, fire. But if we look at the entire universe as all existing on this cycle and transforming in a, a direction back toward pure fire again and through the cycle again, that is to say everything in the cosmos must be passed through fire, must become fire, must be judged by fire, that it, nothing at, at all whatsoever escapes this. Mm. It's, a, it's a perfect economy. And in the sense that it's a perfect economy that just cyclically repeats forever mm -hmm. in, in a democratic fashion, nothing is left right. out. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. It's there's no injustice to be found. Right. That's, this is, you know, his concept of justice. Mm -hmm. and, and it's also the way that he's, that he's going to justify the whole entire universe. It's also through war. You know, there is nothing that's not participating linked to the result of, et cetera, every way you can say it, war. Right. And in this sense, nothing is escaping this. There's, there's no sense in which something is better than, you know, it, having a better time <laughs> than something else. Mm -hmm. And and what's really fascinating is, is, and Nietzsche picks up on this, is for Heraclitus, when you're not fire, you long to be fire again. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 as Nietzsche will put it, the ring turns itself, it, it desires itself. It mm -hmm. turns towards itself, a self-rolling wheel kind of, mm -hmm. as he puts it in, uh, in Zarathustra. So to, to transfer to Nietzsche here, um, Nietzsche actually said, and this is the only time he ever said anything like this, he said uh, that Heraclitus might have already uh, articulated his doctrine of the eternal return of the same. Oh, oh so yeah, when, when you were telling me about fire, I was like, man, this, this definitely sounds like the eternal return of the same. It sounds yeah. a lot like it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a crazy admission of his. And, and, and I think I thought it was uh, said another way. I thought it was, he said, Heraclitus could have written this. I, but uh, if I remember correctly, he says, uh, Heraclitus might have already written it. You know? mm -hmm. right. uh, and, and I think he's right with this turning of fire. And, mm -hmm. you know, I point this out to say Nietzsche's eternal return of the same, which is built technically on will to power. Mm -hmm. So here we're, we're starting to see a parallel. Mm -hmm. between the two, because they're really trying to do the same project. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say they're exactly the same. Nietzsche has volumes of work written. Heraclitus only has fragments. Um, but, their man, their approach is almost identical. You see this in Nietzsche's veneration of him. What he's really venerating is himself and another philosopher. Mm -hmm. um, so with the eternal return, um, you could say, and I'm actually working on this right now, mm -hmm. Uh, you could say that we have the turnings of will to power. Oh, Heraclitus, that's, that's nice. Heraclitus had the turnings of fire, of the paras, mm -hmm. paras tropoi. Mm -hmm. uh, Nietzsche would have, uh, I think he really was positing the same thing, a, a, the turnings of, of will to power. Um, but, you know, what's really interesting, it, it, he gave up on this, right? He, he, <laughs> yeah. he, or went crazy, or however, right. you know, whatever you want right. to say. Whatever the story um, is, if you want to believe in. But man, no one's ever picked up the ball there. and, and <laughs> I don't blame them. <laughs> yeah. It's tough people, stuff. And, and what people do, which I think is such a cheap shot, is, uh, you know, it's, it's really similar to perhaps to what they do with Freud. Mm -hmm. They say, oh, Nietzsche abandoned this project because 
uh, he realized it, it was just not him. You know, it's he would become Kant. Uh, so he was like, oh, sorry, I got to turn around now. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe there's a degree of truth to this, this kind of struggle. But um, no, I, I think whether Nietzsche wanted to to complete this project, that is to make a cosmology out of will to power, yeah, uh, kind of complete his philosophy. Whether he really wanted to do that or not, I don't actually care. Uh, I, I find where he stopped to be fascinating. Mm -hmm. And um, so what I would like to do probably, uh, you know, in a couple of years on my dissertation, uh, I've got to find hopefully somebody to, to do this with. Right, yeah. Um, I, I would love to, to theorize about this kind of turnings of will to power. And the reason why I say this is because, uh, you know, Nietzsche's re eternal return of the same is really similar to Heraclitus's turning to fire, but Nietzsche, Nietzsche said, or Zarathustra, um, said that essentially if you have a finite amount of stuff, that the universe, mm -hmm. you have a finite amount of stuff, think about it, about it as energy, if you will, you know, however, you know, the basic, sure. whatever basic you want to strip down to. And then you have uh, an eternity, so an infinite amount of time, or you could say just simply an infinite amount of arrangements. Mm -hmm. Or I should back up and say you have an infinite amount of stuff. You have constant transformation. Mm -hmm. Then you have an infinite amount of time, mm -hmm. which is to say an eternity is ring. Right. It's not a, it's not an infinite amount of time with a beginning or an end. It's mm -hmm. not. It's, it's not a, sort of a, I was say circular, but I mean, it, it, it's it is a, circular. It, it, yeah, yeah, it, it kind of starts and ends and kind of goes in a circle. Yeah, so it's eternal. Mm -hmm. um, if you have these three factors, finite stuff, constant transformation, and eternity, then you end up with the eternal return of the same. That is mm -hmm. to say, you end up with an infinite repetition of all of the possible combinations mm -hmm. of all the possible combinations. Uh, so he famously says in Zarathustra, um, you know, imagine you're, you know, I, I think how it goes, uh, imagine an evil demon comes to you in the night and says, you know, this life, exactly how you've lived it, this very moment, that bird in the tree, that the phase of the moon and the position of the blade of grass. Mm -hmm. um, imagine that you had to live this self same life exactly how it is over and over and over and over. And it's this challenge in Zarathustra, you know, to kind of root out bad conscience, to, to kind of point to, like, hey, are you affirming your life, living it in a way that you would be happy to live it for eternity? Yeah. Uh, but he actually meant this. Mm -hmm. and, and what I mean is, in kind of more of a physics, he meant this. He, he, he meant a cosmology that, that would produce an, an infinite amount of times the same set of results because you know and i think he's right i think that is just how the that shakes out other philosophers or other cosmologies would disagree on different points there spinoza for example uh the substance or the cosmos must be infinite absolutely infinite so you know you don't end up with anything like the eternal return of the same right. um, but when you start with a finite like you did and, and with these premises i think it shakes out that way and i think it's also heraclitus i think it's the same yeah. thing Oh, you can definitely, um, you can definitely see that in there as well. Yeah, and you know the thing that Nietzsche never did, where he quit, it quit, you could say, mm -hmm. uh, where he stopped, mm -hmm. um, was that he never derived the many from the one. Mm -hmm. This is what Heraclitus's turnings of fire is. He's trying to represent to you how fire can transform into other things, which is to say, he's trying to show you how. Water can be considered fire. All can be one. It's all on this one ring transforming back to the same spot. Mm -hmm. uh, for Nietzsche, and so in that way with Heraclitus, he's, he's developing the many from the one. For Nietzsche, he says everything is will to power, but he never developed the many from the one. Hmm. He so never... He's inverse he never, of what, what, what Heraclitus was doing in some ways. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you have to do it you know, Spinoza had to do the same thing. You know, mm -hmm. uh, there's one thing; it's absolutely infinite, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, how do we, how do we therefore move to what is our life experience, and that is a, a, a world of particulars? Yeah, um, a valid distinction, you might say. 
And for Spinoza, he ended up kind of saying, well, you know, this is kind of a secondary realm where like, yeah, it's true, but you're not really, you're not really looking at things here. Mm -hmm. uh, Nietzsche doesn't really say that. You know, Heraclitus says Nietzsche, uh, says that nature likes to hide, nature loves to hide. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he says the unseen harmony is better than the seen, the visible. And Nietzsche actually criticizes Heraclitus on this point and says that he's falsifying the senses a little bit. Mm, interesting. You know, kind of positing this, you know, this other world that hides, you know, the true, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? For Nietzsche, he, he wants to, to reject that. He, he, can't, he can't do that. He wants to fully affirm this world is the only world, you know, the... There is no human world and then some other world. It's, mm -hmm. you know, and at the same time, that's not to deny perspective, but you can only affirm perspective to a certain extent if you want to formulate a, a positive uh, philosophy mm -hmm. or value system. You know, you have to kind of choose. Mm -hmm. um, so for, for Nietzsche, he never took the step of deriving how you would get the very uh, the the various different manifestations of things and particulars from the one will to power, mm -hmm. um, and uh, anyway, I, I think that's a, a fascinating notion for philosophers to pick up on, and I've never seen anyone pick Term up on that really. Yeah, I mean, tremendously. Um, I mean, and I think sometimes it, it, you know history is favorable or unfavorable towards you know people when they they end, and you know I think like no one. No one really cared about Nietzsche when he was doing this stuff when he was alive, and then just kind of like afterwards, people were like, "Wait a minute! Like, wait a minute! Like, this is some this is some really good stuff." And then you know, so it kind of has iterations. So I'll say this: um, I know we're coming at the two hour mark. I uh, nice. I, I want to be I want to be respectful of, of your time and everything. So let's let's do. I think this would be really helpful because um, when I wrote down some of the stuff that we were going to get into today. You know, talk about you know cosmology, philosophy. You know, kind of the sort of the you know, Platonic kind of elements. Uh, we talked about Freud, and we were touching on a lot of things here. In, in your estimation, because people, I think this is this is the central focus for. I mean, look, Nietzsche is powerful, and and I'm sure we'll we'll get together again and talk about very very specifics about Nietzsche because he he deserves more hours of of focus. But this is a good. A good, good, good foundation. But the central, and how I see it, the central piece of Nietzsche's philosophy, which is probably in Zarathustra and then also in you know the, the writings he had before he died, is this will to power. Now, Nietzsche talked about a lot of things, moral philosophy. He talked about values. He talked about, you know, he's pretty damning on Christianity, rightfully so. And all the rest. He talked about he talked about the Greeks, you know, he talked about philosophy proper, he talked about culture in some ways. But really, and I mean you've already been kind of you know flirting around this, but his central thesis is, I think, uh, will to power. That's his main Absolutely. that's his main thing. So tell us what is how you how you how you read it. What is will to power, or how did Nietzsche mean will to power, and definitely what it's not? Because I definitely think that's people get that very confused of what it is uh, not, you know, or you know, this, this, and this, and this, and it, it is not an accurate reading. I don't think so. Tell us a, a lot of. I'll, I'll just say this. I think a lot of smart, <laughs> intellectual people get this wrong, and I'm not saying that you have the right answer. I have the right answer, but what is the based on a reading of Nietzsche as accurately as you can be or try to be? What is what is will to power? Uh, yeah. What does that yeah. mean? Well, uh, it's a great question, and um, and it's really it's it's really important. Um, so you know, I guess to start out, uh, we could say I don't think Nietzsche ever finished formulating the answer to this question. Mm -hmm. okay. That is not to say that the, that he did not formulate a lot on this question. So um, it's it's incomplete. And the fact that he didn't finish, but it's not inadequate. Yeah. You know yeah. Well, and part of the reason why I say that is because you see a development in the notion. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, you know, it, it's kind of like progressive revelation. You, know, you kind of see the early kernels of it, and then you see it developing in his middle. And then toward the end, he's really developing it in, in what is published. His notes are published, Will to mm -hmm. Power, not right. anything he actually published. Uh, 
So right. in these notes, you begin to see, you know, it's, it's a guy walking, making notes to himself, trying to work out a theory. I'm not trying to dumb down with the power for Nietzsche. It's a thoroughly, you know, fascinating and rich concept that he, he is, you know, has developed. I just think it, it, uh, it has way more potentiality in it for development, and I think he knew that. Mm. Um, now, to, to kind of try to dispel, like you were saying, some of what it's not, yeah, yeah. I remember my first uh, interaction with a class where this topic was seriously discussed. There were a bunch of, uh, uh, well, there were a couple really brilliant Christians mm -hmm. in the classroom. And this is kind of a, a liberal arts philosophical setting. Mm -hmm. Everyone's really sharp. You know, it was a really awesome place. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was fascinating to see their interpretation of Nietzsche's will to power. Let me guess. Let me let me let me let me. I'm gonna I'm gonna get in here real quick. Let me guess. They were they were somehow framing this through some type of Judeo-Christian or some type of lens where that shadow of a, a deity is still looming. Yeah, yeah, that's part of it. They were doing that absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, the thing I think that um, was was interesting about what they were doing is they interpret Nietzsche to be saying something prescriptive. Hmm. Okay. Keep going with that. They wanted to run with the, the common theme that Nietzsche is this bad, bad guy, you know, evil, you know, Nazi progenitor or something of that right. nature. Um, right. And, and so under that lens, I mean, it, it makes sense. Uh, you, you hear will to power. It's got this kind of, it's got a little uh, bit of a... You know, a very casual right. reading of it. I, sure, you can see how it could be, you know, weaponized for, I mean, tons of horrible ideas or thoughts or actions. I mean, absolutely. A yeah. casual, kind of the face validity, cursory reading of it, certainly. Yeah, yeah. And and I bring that up to say that what it's not, and, and, it, and this is complex because there's a sense in which what I'm saying is not true, but... For people who are first approaching this this idea, you've got to understand that it's a description first and foremost of the cosmos, of reality, of everything. That's what he's doing. He 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 famously says in in Zarathustra, uh, he says, "Look, I've looked into the heart, the soul of life. Tell me if I'm wrong." He says, "I looked. I looked. You know, the idea, the image is like he got down and just." <laughs> looked with the with the biggest magnifying glass he could at the essence of life, and he said, "What I see when I look with that resolution everywhere, all I see is will to power. That's all I see." And so, in this sense, it's important right off the bat to understand that this is descriptive for him primarily. He's not trying to say go outside and punch people and you know take over the world because will to power is the best and I'm German and you know. It's not that. Right. And let me just, I don't, I don't, I don't want to detour, uh, just as, a, as a, a, a refining point here. And, 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 you know, maybe you can agree or disagree with this. We don't have to talk about it now, but just as a distinction point, saying that will to power from, I guess, kind of like as a first pass or first basis that it's descriptive, I can't help but think of to the things themselves, which is literally the definition of phenomenology. And there is a lot of Nietzsche in phenomenology. And how would you, is there a difference? I mean, there's obviously a difference in how phenomenologists, where they take it and where they go with it, right? Which is, which is different. But would that be an overlapping point there? Yeah, although I would say um, Nietzsche would, I, to be honest, I think Nietzsche would, would write volumes of diatribes <laughs> against phenomenology. Oh, I could see that. I could see I think that. He would be perhaps harder on them than you know maybe anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, why? Because it's this kind of grotesque uh, over emphasis of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Where for Freud and Nietzsche, consciousness is is really some second rate stuff. Yes, in, in the framework in which you're doing it. Although I wouldn't say, you know, for example, I'll just give you an example. If you read Being in Time, it's, you know, 400, 480 pages. I think consciousness itself is described and then named 
on like the last five pages. So yeah. I would say phenomenology has, you know, I, I think Merleau Ponty definitely starts dipping his his foot in in the consciousness uh, debate. But I, I definitely think that there's a handful that still what they're doing is outside of consciousness. You know, I think Husserl yeah. did that. I think uh, Heidegger did that. I think, you know, there's a lot of guys that aren't even touching consciousness. They're really just trying to, you know, the unveiling, the unprocessed, the, you know, the whole like to the things themselves, how do we just get at the essence of what the things are? And so my question was, was just how, is there some on that, and on that landscape, I do see that will to power is, has some, uh, crossover with that aspect yeah. of phenomenology. So you're, you're talking about the uh, the approach that's looking for you know kind of essential aspects of a thing, right? You, you, mm -hmm. you know, or, yeah, and in that sense, yeah, they are they are uh, they are sharing a lot in common. However, I would say you know that that's kind of something that you'll see pop up all throughout you know various different branches of philosophy. Fair. Um, and and what Heraclitus. And probably, you know, I haven't spent a lot of time with Heidegger, mm -hmm. um, but but with uh, Heraclitus, and it sounds like with Heidegger, but especially with Heraclitus and Nietzsche, uh, they're trying to do this this uh, cosmology. Right? It, I'm I'm not sure if you can really say that about uh, these other thinkers, right? Um, so in that sense, yeah, what they're doing is interesting and and possibly beneficial, but it's very unidimensional. Uh, even though it's trying to, and I'm not saying it's not trying to, you know, include and does include multi-dimension. Mm -hmm. right, right, right. Uh, to get kind of complicated, it's a multi-dimensional approach to, a, you know, kind of a unidimensional thing. You know? mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think Nietzsche would really respect the amount of work and rigor given what we're looking at and the payout that you get from, you know, spending your life <laughs> analyzing this particular Being thing. itself. <laughs> yeah. Um, Nietzsche famously says, and tying this into Heraclitus, and I think he read this, uh, he commented on it, uh, being, Heraclitus will forever be right in his assertion that being is an empty fiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, um, and, and, I, and I know there is, you know, we, we, can, we can talk about that at another point, but there is definitely, it's, it's fascinating that, you know, both Heidegger and Nietzsche have written and talked a lot about Her Heraclitus in and it's obviously opposite perspectives, but they're just a com at least opposite lenses. You know, Heidegger's emphasis is on being itself, which is where he would say reality is wrapped up within being, because that's all you know. You know, whereas Nietzsche is saying it completely different, right? You know, yeah. he's talking about cosmology and life outside of oneself or how there is a connection, but how it's outside of it. So this is, maybe it's just a, a very different, um, kind of a sharpening of a lens of sorts or two different lenses, but it is, it is a, it is a very interesting, uh, kind of debate. Okay. Yeah. So let's, let's, yeah. let's go back to will of power though. So, okay. So it's not, it's definitely descriptive, not prescriptive. What well, else and, is it, or is it not? Well, you can, you know, and, and someone who perhaps knows this, this, uh, this, theory really well might say, well, it is a little prescriptive and, and you could say that. And, and that's kind of far down, you know, down the lane. That is to say, uh, you know, there's a sense in which Nietzsche, if he has an ethic, that it is an ethic of, uh, of understanding the sense of existence and kind of living in harmony with that or not trying to stiff arm the sense of existence, you know, flowing uh, everywhere, mm -hmm. um, which he says is will to power. Right. Right. Another way he says this, is meaning of the earth. Mm. And we're going to, as I say these, we're moving up kind of in resolution. Mm -hmm. So what? We've got will to power. We've got uh, meaning of the earth. And we've got Superman. Right. The, the and same perhaps, as Ubermensch. <laughs> yeah. And, and perhaps we could stick vitality somewhere in there as a fourth kind of marker mm -hmm. on the you know gradations of or, uh, resolutions of will to power, however you'd like to say it. Right, right. Um, and and I guess what I'm trying to say is Superman, meaning of the earth, and even vitality. You know, you might say health for a Nietzschean sense. Sure. All of these terms are much like Heraclitus was looking at the one. Mm -hmm. All of these are kind of different lenses on will to power. Yeah. One. Yeah. So you have the okay. logos for Heraclitus, and then you have the becoming justice war and fire. Fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and and for for Nietzsche, you have various his philosophy. If if you were to, I would I would guess if you were to talk to him at the end of his life, the way he would probably be conceptualizing this philosophy, if you wanted to get him serious, um, mm -hmm. it would probably have to be something really similar to Heraclitus in the sense that he's saying everything is will to power. My philosophy is telling you the different ways you can look at the one mm -hmm. and see it as one. Mm -hmm. Right? I, I'm saying Nietzsche's formulating a cosmology with will to power because just like Heraclitus, it is the one explanation or rationale that explains everything else. The one the one thing as one. It's okay. this yeah. it's this it's, it's this loop again that you get. Mm -hmm. Um so moving to kind of flesh out the theory a little bit, you know, uh to put it really bluntly, the will to power is the inherent impetus for the expression of one's energy or force. Mm -hmm. You could put it, uh, the expenditure of one's energy is probably the best way to put it. And when I say one, I don't just mean a person. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about, again, everything, everything you can conceptualize, even concepts. Mm -hmm. it, it, this, this will to power, right? Meme theory, picking up on Dawkins, yeah. Uh, there's no distinction here with will to power between the conceptual and the physical. And, you know, what's also really fascinating, too, with this cosmology, there's also no separation or ultimate distinction between life and non-life. Mm -hmm. It's and, well, this, and, this, and this sort of kind of blends in with the Freudian thing we started with, right? Yeah. Um, because uh, Freud does kind of pull it apart of sorts. I mean, he sees them as connected in a way, but he does do, at the very least, he's parsing out that kind of concept but for Nietzsche it is life and non-life is will to power yeah both are uh, the rock is will to power the rocking chair uh, rock music <laughs> you know it's, a, it's all will to power that's what makes you know people tend not to appreciate the staggering force of cosmologies like this mm -hmm. the, the conceptual power of these things is, is ridiculous it's a game that humans have forgotten to play well, and and, uh, and 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 bringing up Dar, I mean, Darwinian, uh, you know, theory, you know, the, the power of, I mean, the, I mean, the true power of evolution, um, as Darwin saw it, and, and and everything else is, you know, the fact of life is that you have, at the very least, natural and sexual selection, and sometimes when I explain this to people, they'll say, well, what, how is nature doing the selecting, right? And I, and I can't help but want to just place in that will to power. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. If it's the behind the curtain of the natural selecting, if there's, no, there's no rhyme or reason necessarily, right? And I'm not saying that's the only thing, because I think will to power is much more than that, but it's at least that, I would say, and how we understand it, what, what you're saying in terms of even behind the meta of concepts, such as the fact of there's the thing that's happening right with natural selection but the con the thing and the concept that we understand of natural selection all that's driving that in you know kind of inherent force is will to power in in all of those iterations and all of the, the meta kinds of ways of understanding it is how and how i see it yeah it's kind of the fuel for the process I mean, it's, it's the it's the it's the alternator <laughs> yeah and and you know and, and nietzsche would would point out too that we have to be careful about how we you know, when we're doing a cosmology or a cosmological notion like this, you know, it's like will to power produces these things. Mm -hmm. You know, these things all result. So he's he's positing a first cause of all things. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, just like uh, Heraclitus's war, or just like uh, yeah, his war. This is fluctuating tension. And you know, I'll say here, this is where I, I'm pretty sure I'm developing a novel reading of will to power here, or, or I think I will, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. starting to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether it ends up, you know, really working out for me in the end or not is, is, you know, to be determined. But staying with this connection with Heraclitus, mm -hmm. I think Nietzsche accepts, if, if you read his, his uh, thoughts on, on Heraclitus and is in, in joining that with his philosophy, I think Nietzsche accepts Heraclitus' philosophy. Mm -hmm. I think you could at least say Nietzsche accepts this universal fluctuating tension mm -hmm. of polarities. 
Mm -hmm. I think he accepts this. And I think, you know, uh, picking up on so many things that he says, I think Nietzsche was trying to one up Heraclitus <laughs> or contend with him. Mm -hmm. he, he, you know, I, I'm, I think every good thinker should be doing the same thing. You run into thinkers and concepts, you try to figure out why they're wrong. And if you do, you move on. If right. you don't, you, you know, put it in your pocket until <laughs> you can find something better. Um, <laughs> I think uh, Nietzsche identified Heraclitus as the pinnacle. Yeah. And, and Which is insane in, considering how long ago it was. Oh, yeah. It's and, insane. Yeah. And, and not just the pinnacle in, in personality, but also in philosophy, mm -hmm. which is to say he accepts, I think, he accepts this polar fluctuating tension. He accepts polymas, all his polymas. Uh, yeah, the polymas, yeah. So then he says, how do I one-up you? He says, well, I would like to present the impetus for each fighter. <laughs> Will to power. Will to power. It's right. inside each one of the two. Right. That's right. what the one warrior is after in his battle with the other. Mm -hmm. It's will to power. Mm -hmm. um, but what's really fascinating here, and I, I mentioned this in my paper, is I think, and I think Nietzsche knew this, Heraclitus would have said, oh, ha, 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 and where you now see one, I again see two. <laughs> right? Oh, you think your will to power is one, but inside of this will to power is a fluctuating <laughs> polarity. And t you know. um, right. But I think that's what Nietzsche was trying to get past. He said, okay, yeah, you think everything's this, this fighting pair, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to say, no, it's not a fighting pair. It's just one thing, fueling mm -hmm. the fighting pair everywhere. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for, for Nietzsche, you have a philosophy of becoming. Everything's in flux. You have total aesthetic affirmation through suffering, mm -hmm. just like Heraclitus. He's justifying the world through its most heinous feature. That's right. the method of justification. It's the same uh, for Nietzsche uh, in the sense that will to power is it's, it's that which produces strife, contention, mm -hmm. competition, war. And, and, and I, think this is, I think this is probably where through this will to power, I mean, it's all over Nietzsche's writings is this emphasis, rightly so, and, 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 and having this emphasis on this is also why we should, well, why it doesn't work. But then also, I think he goes, and he's, to me, I think he's written still the best damning critique of Christianity that exists. I think it's just absolutely brilliant. But the instincts that yeah. is for us, will. The instincts that we have are being fueled by the force of will to power and anything that is going to suppress instinct, especially with how far it's gotten us, is poisonous. It's harmful. It's, and, and this is out of that comes all of his philosophy, his moral philosophy about, you know, the revaluation of all values, right? Right. You know, yeah. they're, they're, you know, and, and, and he writes, I mean, just terribly convincingly <laughs> against that. And it's so hard to like, I remember the first time years and years and years ago, I read Nietzsche and it was just, I mean, <laughs> it, it's, it's very hard to think that way. And then once you get past that speed bump, then it, everything just kind of like starts clicking and it's like, oh, okay, yeah. boom, boom, yeah. boom. Okay. I get it now. Yeah. It's very hard to unthink it. But that, but when you understand will to power and its connection with the instinctual life, it it makes so much more sense in that kind of kind of all back to what we said in the beginning of this very active participatory notion, which outside of that is again, this is how we were saying earlier about this very people have this cursory reading of Nietzsche, but no, I, I still run into people that say, oh, isn't Nietzsche just a nihilist? It's like, oh, my goodness, you have not read Nietzsche. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's not yeah, it's so yeah. antithetical to that, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But anyway, so let me talk about the, the, uh, the instincts uh, just you know, briefly uh, and how that, and how that uh, plays out. Yeah, well, um, with the instincts, it's, 
And this is part of it, right? This is part of the psychology or the psychic model that was never completely fleshed out you know, in terms of how the will to power is relating to the instincts. But I think you said it right. You know, uh, for Nietzsche, you know, I think we, we'd have to step back and say, too, Christianity is will to power. Mm -hmm. Christian morality that mm -hmm. condemns will to power is will to power, too. Yes. You see, uh, uh, Mother Teresa... Mm -hmm. was will to power. The way she acted was also will to power. Yeah? <laughs> and, right. and Heraclitus would say it was also Palamon. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the reason why, the reason why I bring that up, I guess, is, is to say that when it comes to will to power, it manifests in all these different ways. Because, again, Nietzsche is saying that's all there is. So right. when we see these different modes of behavior, we see these different instincts, we see hunger, we see libido or sex drive, we see perhaps even repression, right? right? All of these are various, they're various sorts of actions of will to power. They're expressions, you might say, of will to power. They're right. all the same thing unfolding in different ways. And so touching back on the consciousness, and again, Nietzsche didn't really develop this too much. For him, the body, or you could say the instincts, yep. are kind of in a meta body type of way. Yeah, the that the id or the it, you know, as as he he coined that phrase, the, yeah. the id, mm -hmm. Nietzsche. Um, Freud took that from Nietzsche, and and what he what he's really talking about here is that you've got this kind of ancient, uh, highly developed, sophisticated expression of will to power in you know the human, mm -hmm. and then along comes recent in our development, consciousness. Or this kind of self-reflective, you know, future forecasting, you know, abstraction, whatever you'd like to call it. He right. says this is new. Mm -hmm. um, he says this is a, you know, relatively speaking, this is a new development. And he says, therefore, weak, yeah. comparatively speaking, to yeah. these drives, these instincts that right. have been there and have developed forever. Um, so for him, which this is something I really have to tease out in, in my thesis, He's really presenting this struggle between the instincts in a person, the, these, these uh, extreme desires for uh, the expression of power, or you could say really what he presents as instincts is, is kind of in a modern way a, a ton of subpersonalities mm -hmm. that compose a person that all want what they want and they want it now. Mm -hmm. and, right. Right. and it's not a want that comes from, uh, from a lack. Yeah. That's, what, that's what's key here. It's it's a it's a wanting for. It's not a free from. It's a free for. Do you see? Yeah, a, a, that's great. Um, you know, so he's he's trying to describe this this you know this this kind of swarm of desiring expressions of will to power. You know, so they have to kind of differentiate inside of a person. Mm -hmm. um, and then along comes consciousness itself, the you know the ego, you might say. Yeah. Um, and he he's pitting those really against each other. Sure. Because you know, just going back to the very beginning of our conversation, you know, it's 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 an again an acknowledgement of psychic conflict at its essence. You know, when mm -hmm. we want to talk about the psyche and what's going on and what is it, it's a you know, it's kind of essentially this this dynamic process in tension somehow. Right. You know, back to Heraclitus too. Um, so when it comes to the instincts, Nietzsche is really seeing his consciousness trying to somehow manage and be an add-on to this body of instincts. Um, and in this sense, too, consciousness is, an, is another expression of will to power. Biologically, it's that, you know, our frontal lobe, if you will. Um, yep. It just, it's new, and it's kind of clunky, you know. It, it, yeah. We haven't, it's, just, it's, it's like we it's haven't very, grown into it. <laughs> yeah, it's very underdeveloped. Yeah, and, and this, is, this is what he would say is driving things like Christian morality, mm -hmm. right? He's ultimately going to root things like this, guilt, um, pity. Uh, pity, revenge, ultimately in this, uh, this impetus for self-preservation. Mm -hmm. um, not So this is a key distinction between Nietzsche's will to power and Darwinian thinking, mm -hmm. is for Nietzsche, there's absolutely no uh, instinct for self-preservation. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, in other words, you know, it is really will to power, like all the way through. Self-preservation, he says, is just a common manifestation of will to power. It's a derivative. Mm -hmm. But 
in terms of you know instincts um you don't have the you know that which has life doesn't desire life in, in other words uh, right. and nor does it just run around in its life trying to avoid death uh which is really the freudian model right? the life is essentially you know, yeah you're trying to die in your own way uh, <laughs> right as opposed to Nietzsche's die at the right time, which is another really great nodal point to represent this active and passive. For Nietzsche, you know, you, you want, and tying this into will to power, you know, when you want to kind of collectively as a self, instincts, consciousness and all, put forward, you know, your, your project, we might say today, um, right. maybe even a whole new philosophy, maybe uh, whatever it may be, this, this imposition that you mm. would like to put on the world. Yeah. Um, that's will to power as well. And, and what's interesting with Nietzsche and the reason why I was talking about the turnings of will to power mm -hmm. is that there's clearly, since everything is will to power, let's say we have Christian morality on this end mm -hmm. and we have, uh, I don't know, Alexander the Great on the other, you know, <laughs> maybe that's not a good example, but you have Jesus and Alexander the Great, let's yeah. put them Right. Put them against each other. Put them in the ring. Yeah. Uh, I, let's say... Uh, human, I human, is, human Jesus, not deity Jesus. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, let's say that those represent two poles yeah. of, of will to power in kind of a Heraclitian opposition fashion. Mm -hmm. um, and the Nietzsche war. Might, yeah, and Nietzsche might perhaps you know, spec, you know, uh, squabble about who we put there, but something like this is fair to say. For Nietzsche, you can chart... The, uh, gradations of will to power all the way up to someone like, say, Alexander the Great. This is, in other words, this is what I think he was doing with the transvaluations of uh, transvaluation of all values. It's he was going to take will to power, and and you have to do this, deriving the many from the one with will to power. Essentially, what you're going to do is come up with a hierarchy, a value system. Yep. Alexander the Great is a better expression of will to power than Jesus, is yes. what he wants to say. Or perhaps you could say Dionysus was the crucified, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Great way of saying it. There are different modes, kind of going into the Spinoza cosmology. These are different modes and uh, of the same thing. But, and this is, this is something that I've been developing a little bit. And um, on this notion of, a value structure or a revaluation, a hierarchy of will mm -hmm. to power, mm -hmm. which I think you have to infer from Nietzsche. Yeah. I, I've been postulating something. Uh, did I ever talk to you about the, the twin goddesses, the twin heiress goddesses? I don't think so. Um, Nietzsche touches on this a lot with Heraclitus. Nietzsche says Heracle Heraclitian polymos, war. Yep. He says that concept is Hesioids. Eris, goddess, which mm -hmm. means strife. It's, it's the goddess of, like, the jealousy that leads to competition, mm -hmm. right? This generative force leading right. to competition. Nietzsche said that Heraclitus' war was Hesiod's Eris deified. Um, uh, uh, interpret that. <laughs> okay. What I mean by that is the ancient Greeks were, uh, this concept of Heraclitus' war is so Greek. It's the Greekest Greek you can get, uh, yeah. ancient Greek. It's oozing Greek. Ancient yeah, they valued uh, they valued uh, surpassing a foe through a superb uh, performance. Right, that that kind of rests at the essence of their culture. Right. Heraclitus really emphasizes that he deifies that with this concept that already existed: the Eris goddess, the goddess right. called Eris. It was you know in their pantheon of goddess or of gods, uh, Eris was a female goddess. Uh, was a goddess. <laughs> And uh, she was meant to represent strife. I mean, the, the word means strife. And, and uh, uh, the whole point with that is, is, is that they, they literally deified, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, deified strife, this, mm -hmm. this kind of proto-war concept, that which leads to war, if you will. And another way you could say it, too, is uh, you could look at this heiress, this strife, this goddess, as a will to power too. There's a really close yeah. relation there. Yeah, absolutely. Nietzsche says Heraclitus' war is a deification of this heiress. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Nietzsche comes along and picking up on heiress and Heraclitus' polymos, 
he kind of deifies right the impetus for Palamas. You could say it going it's going back to Eris again. All this to say, and this is kind of complicated, and I'm still working it out. Um, Nietzsche talks about a different version of Hesiod's play where this goddess Eris appears. Mm. Okay, just like uh, our Bible, you could say in the ancient times their gods appeared in plays and these and these these iconic, you know, huge pieces of literature that were super influential. Influential. Uh, Homer with the uh, Iliad and the Odyssey. Hesiod was uh, even earlier than that. Right. Uh, and Hesiod, in a, a, a play, I believe, called Works and Days, posits he's the one who formulated this notion of the goddess Eris, this right. goddess of you know, strife. Yeah. However, there is an alternate version <laughs> that Nietzsche talks about that someone supposedly saw back in the day of Hesiod's play where there are twin goddesses. Hmm. Two heiresses, hmm. not just one. In other words, we're talking about the impetus, the impetus for competition, the impetus for war is what we're talking hmm. about here. There we used to be in, in common parlance back in that time, there was just one, right? Heraclitus right. is, is uh, deifying the one you could call the original one that we're talking about here, the, the one heiress. Let's call it the good heiress. Hmm. Let's say it's generative. In other words, you write a book, I get jealous. And, you know, and instead of, uh, you know, doing all kinds of things I could do to try to get back at you or back at myself for not writing a book or something, I sit down and I try to write a better book than you wrote. Mm -hmm. In other words, you see the generative feature. It, it creates, mm -hmm. it, it builds things, mm -hmm. this heiress. Right. So that was the notion that you could say the Greeks worshipped highest of all. Yeah. And is embodied or emulated uh, in Heraclitian uh, philosophy to to its ex highest extent. Now Nietzsche is going to say, "Will to power is this?" Now what I'm what I'm getting at here is with this twin god Eris, you have the good Eris, the mm -hmm. jealousy or the fuel that leads to generative strife, right. war, competition. Then you have the bad Eris, which is this same type of jealousy, but it it differs in the sense that it's that which makes me want to make you not be able to write a book anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can beat you in a couple of different ways. I can express my will to power against you, right? In other words, for Nietzsche, the will to power is really this seek, this, this constant seeking to establish dominance in, in a really rich concept, in a really rich way, right? Not just yeah. a kind of superficial, easily dismissed notion. Right. Um, and so with this twin heiress notion, you have that which leads to uh, the ultimately the expression of dominance that leads to uh, the desire to take someone out in kind of this great Greek performance where I write a better book, say. Mm -hmm. Then in, in the bad heiress, you have this, uh, this fueling desire to make it so you can't compete anymore. So it's just a, it's just a obfuscation of that. That's right. all well, it's trying it, to do. I'm just trying to get in the way. I'm interference. That's it. Uh, I'm not. I'm not trying to necessarily create something better to to transcend it. I'm trying to just make sure you don't. And that's the 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 point. Yeah. If we assume that everything is a competition, everything is this struggle, this tension. Uh, the second type of heiress, the bad type of heiress, mm -hmm. wants to make it so you can't participate anymore. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. how it wants to beat you. The first yeah. type of heiress, the good heiress, the one really embodied in Heraclitian war, mm -hmm. it's generative. It says, I am so jealous of what you did. I kind of hate you, but my God, I respect what you did. And I really want to do something better than it. Right. I want to beat you that way. <clears throat> I'm yeah. positing, I'm positing in relation to Nietzsche's will to power, a third heiress goddess. Okay. Okay. And what I'm trying to get at here is the turnings or the transformation of will to power. We've mm. got Good heiress, you can yeah, say good yeah, will to power. Mm -hmm. We've got bad. Mm -hmm. And these are different ways of interacting, so to speak. Right. And then the third one would be, you could call it the evil heiress. Mm -hmm. And I see this in Nietzsche's moral critiques. Mm -hmm. Because this third mode of competition, you will, if you will, this third mode of will to power, right. doesn't just seek to take out what you can do as a competitor. Right? I'm not just trying to take out my opponent. Right. What the third type of heiress does, the evil heiress, tries to take out competition. Hmm, interesting. 
So, so it's just the whole know, the whole enterprise. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's self destructive. Yeah. Nietzsche Hence the says evil. that. Yeah, Nietzsche says that morality is degeneration as will to power. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in other words, you know, if we want to go back to a Heraclitian turnings of fire, you're you're really presented with something that's like you have the purest yeah. expression of this, and then you have kind of a watered down, like a reverse filtration where something gets kind of more corrupt as it goes along, right? And then it comes back and it ends up being fodder for pure fire again. Yeah, right. It, it repeats again. In other words, you, you have to describe in a cosmology how something generates mm -hmm. from strife. You have to describe how something is eliminating another through strife. Mm -hmm. And you have to describe how something can eliminate itself through strife. Mm -hmm. and, and these are really, I think, in my mind, these are the beginnings of perhaps some experimental formulations of where Nietzsche left off. Um, yeah. You right. might be able to develop this kind of circular... Mm -hmm. you know, thing with those, um, so much so that you've got Dionysus and Christ mm -hmm. as, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, polarities on this wheel, the turnings of, fire, of, uh, of will to power. Right. Um, so right now that's kind of where I'm thinking with all these things. It'd be really interesting to try to posit will to power in terms of a psychic model, you know, what's going on there. Oh, between it, there's, there's lots of, Lots of uh, uh, runway in front of us on on that on on that yeah. point, which would be yeah. quite the task. But uh, yeah, um, well, look, man, two and a half yeah. hours. We put yeah, a good dent in this. It's. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I could I could keep going, but I feel <laughs> I feel for for anybody listening to this is going to be like, okay, I need to I need to think and and sit with some of this stuff. So, I mean. It's just fantastic uh, how you were able to explain so many things. I really engage, you know, enjoy the the dialogue aspect of it. And, you know, it's interesting. You and I, um, you know, I, I like disagreements. I, I'm not trying to look for them, but we, we really don't, you know, see this very differently. Um, and, you yeah. know, you and I have obviously read the same things and stuff. So, but it's been fan fantastic. And, and I, I, I greatly appreciate you coming on and 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 dialoguing and exchanging about i think really important issues really important topics and ideas from you know a bunch of guys that have been dead for a long time and and how their their structure and their frameworks live on and i mean there was there was like a million things i could have said about how it applies to current day but i wanted to you know we can table that and hold on for that so yeah but i i greatly appreciate it man yeah yeah thank you and i i appreciate uh you uh, wanting me to come on here in the app for a while. Um, yeah, I think your podcast is going to be great. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, telling the future here. It's going to be wonderful. <laughs> Thanks, and, man. Uh, very, very successful. And I'm, <laughs> I'm honored to, uh, to be a part of it. Uh, and just kind of to do any kind of maybe prescriptive or applicative uh, elements here at the end. The world is, is ripe for a new cosmology. <laughs> yes. Yes, ditto to that, for a sure. Really, man. really, really well informed one uh, that uh, is made, you know, uh, with very careful consideration. There's nothing more powerful for us than no. a context to to set life and suffering in, and we don't have anything like people have had before. Yeah, uh, and it's up to it's up to philosophers or thinkers or whoever to to work on this, and so. You know, no, I appreciate I, being able to talk about it. No, I totally agree, and um, I think I think we need to we need to definitely foster people to think very well and very critically, and to engage on on ideas and, and respectful dialogue, and try to to workshop this stuff out. So um, you're on the front lines, man. You're you're doing you're doing some good stuff. Really really good ways of thinking about things in novel ways, um, based on the kind of the backs of everybody else that's done it. You know, in terms of, of thought. So. Keep doing what you're doing, and uh, and we'll 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 definitely get on here again. All right, awesome, man. Thank you for having me. All right, man.